Okay, dear colleagues, hello. It's a great pleasure to be here and to see you all uh, in our conference. Uh, I should say, uh, I will just say a couple of words because, because it is not an opening, not an official opening of the conference. The real opening uh, will take place four hours later. Uh, but just to say that, uh, to say hello and uh, to say welcome. And I hope Mato uh, Maestro will also say a couple of words. Okay, so thank you, Andre, and uh, a very well, uh, warm welcome uh, to all of you also from my side and from the side of Politecnico di Milano. 
and uh, we look forward to the next four days with this exciting program and uh, as said by Andre, the official opening will be in four hours from now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mato. So, uh, no more long waiting. Let's go, let's start our work. I uh, forward uh, uh, my dis dispatching uh, rights to chairman of the sections. Good work, colleagues. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Mag ik de muis? Of ja. uh, haar? Want het ziet er net heel iets anders uit dan bij. Uh... Nee, oh, maar meer van als er soms is het kijken. Ik heb zo geen mic, maar waar is hier het geluidsdingetje? Zei je? Het geluidsdingetje, zeg maar. Nee, maar of in ieder geval bij een Windows kun je ook kijken. Wat is dit? Dit is wat het zo moet. En een microfoon doet het wel? Ja, die doet het wel. Ik zal het even aanzien, maar ik wil erop kijken. Is dat niet? Oh ja, nee, we doen het wel. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can hear yes, you. Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Yes. Oh, oh okay. You we are... can hear you. Nice. Good morning, everyone. Ah, now I have sound. Took a while. Very good. Thanks a lot. Михаил, начало через пять минут. Можно начинать через пять минут. Да, да. Спасибо.
Okay, once again, hello, everyone. Uh, we have three minutes before the formal start of our session. And uh, I would like to say a few introductory words. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning, evening, or daytime. I don't know, because we're in different parts of our globe and we have different uh time everywhere but still we are together that's fine that's very good and um uh, let me once again invite you to the first session of the section two chemical reaction engineering and reactor design novel experimental approaches modeling scaling up and optimization let me introduce myself uh, i am uh, Mikhail Sinov from Moscow, from the Institute of Chemical Physics. And uh, I will be your chairman for this morning, first session of our section. And uh, we have an exciting program. Uh, let me remind you a couple of things to the speakers, first of all. Uh, you should first uh, start your presentation in order to be seen, to, to be seen, and then uh, press uh, uh, the button sharing screen on the bottom of your screen uh, or alt s keys okay and a uh, uh, very important inf information for everyone because we are in different halls formal halls vir virtual halls uh, but everything will be available on the website of the conference we have three buttons there uh, three different streams everything is recording and uh, you will be able to see any join any any presentation and a lecture afterwards uh, right after the the end of the presentation and um, please be try to be in in schedule because uh, uh, anyway, we, we are in different halls and some people won't, would like to switch from one hall to another. And um, I would uh, ask speakers to be within approximately 15 minutes uh, with the speech and to, to, to leave about okay. five minutes for questions and discussion. And uh, it's my privilege and my pleasure to start the first session and um, to introduce the first speaker. The first spe the, our first speaker today will be Professor Sasha Kersten from the University of Twente, the Netherlands. And uh, he will present uh, an oral speak, uh, oral speech number one, a method for selection, design, and development of chemical reactors. Professor Kersten, the screens are yours. <laughs> okay. I now got a message that the host disabled uh, me from sharing my screen. Well, let us let us ask um, the technical uh, uh, support to, to to help you. Uh, of course, this is the the very first presentation, and some problems problems may take place. So let let us be patient and ask the yeah. moderator or technical support to help you with this. So first, start the presentation on your computer. And then... Yeah, that's now done. Yeah, it's on. Okay. And then uh, the button, uh, share screen. Or yeah. alt S. Yeah, that now seems to work. Can you now see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, yeah. perfect. Very Thanks. Good. Now, uh, good morning. Good morning from uh, Twente in the Netherlands. Uh, let's hope that uh, we will meet the next time face to face again on your lovely conferences. Um, 
the, well, the, the title of my talk changed. Uh, that was also in the new program. So I'm going to talk about the pyrolysis of, uh, of methane. Uh, that's the title of my talk and also the content. You can also see here my, uh, my co-authors on the first uh, slide. Well, what I will do in this talk, I will uh, give you a, a, a short motivation why methane pyrolysis uh, could be an interesting reaction or, or process. I will show you some, uh, some experimental results, talk about reaction kinetics and modeling. And of course, I will end with some, uh, with some conclusions. Now, the, the current use of methane in the chemical industry is, of course, known to, to all of you. Uh, we use this for gasification. Or I think a better term is, is partial oxidation, producing syngas. Uh, reforming uh, has methane, natural gas, as feedstock, producing also syngas or hydrogen. Well, essentially, the route that we, that we do in, in industry is, uh, is methane to syngas and then to a final end product. Syngas is never the, the end product, it's, in, in, it's intermediate. And, uh, so what we have been doing together with, with industry uh, is uh, uh, alternatives for syngas production and also trying to find a direct route to couple uh, methane to, to all of its. Now, uh, the first alternative uh, that you see over here is on the left. Uh, is the pyrolysis of methane to, to carbon and to hydrogen. Uh, in, we, in our work, we, we don't use a, a catalyst. Uh, so methane to carbon and hydrogen, we practice this at, at one bar, but the, but the pressure can be much higher. What you need is a high temperature, uh, starting from 900 degrees C and up. Uh, what you also need is a, a carrier material to deposit this carbon upon. And that makes the process much more convenient. You can see that uh, this, uh, this reaction uh, allows for carbon sequestration. Uh, so in a uh, CO2 uh, friendlier environment. And you can also see by the reactions that you can see uh, over here that a broad reaction, that a broad range of syngas ratios is, is possible. And that's different as compared to the uh, classical processes just mentioned. Uh, the other one is that we studied is the direct uh, coupling of methane to uh, ethylene in this case. So there is no need to first go to syngas. Uh, uh, we do this at high pressure at 50 to 400 bar at high temperatures. There are no byproducts uh, produced uh, in this reaction. It's only olefins and hydrogen. And that's a big advantage as compared to, for instance, uh, OCM. And as we will see later on, this, this route also allows for, for electrons as, as, uh, as energy input. Now, the chemistry of these processes so of methane conversion is rather well known. You can see it here in this, uh, in this scheme. The overall reaction is, of course, uh, methane gives carbon plus hydrogen, but that's not what actually happens. Uh, it runs over uh, quite a uh, complex uh, reaction network in series and in parallel. The first product you will encounter is actually ethane uh, if you do this uh, reaction. Anyway, without the catalyst, uh, you need a very high temperature to do this. So let's say above 900 degrees uh, centigrade. If ethylene, so the olefin is the product, uh, well, it's obvious that you need to control the reaction time very precisely. So you have a very small window of opportunity to actually produce this product a bit longer time and you will go further down to ethylene, benzene and so on. If you want to go to carbon and, and hydrogen, well, it's very important that you prevent TARS uh, in, this, in this reaction scheme. Now, the, the, the alternative to, to olefins, we tried in a pulse compression uh, reactor. Uh, the pulse compression reactor uh, was introduced at our university some 20 years ago by Kromberg and uh, Kruchenkov. Uh, and what you actually do is that you compress a known volume of gas. You can see that over, over here under, uh, under five uh, by a piston, which is launched uh, by a launch mechanism, which is also a high pressure gas. Uh, 
in practice, you can compare this with a two-stroke engine. Uh, we designed a single shot uh, system in which a known amount of gas uh, is compressed to very high temperatures and uh, pressures. Uh, what we do is we have one to 30% methane in some other gas. The other gas is needed to reach uh, a high temperature. Uh, you can't reach a high temperature with uh, methane. The uh, heating and cooling rate is extremely high, uh, around 100,000 uh, kelvins uh, per second. In the graph here at the right uh, bottom, you see the profiles uh, of pressure and, uh, and temperature. Uh, you see a model pressure and a measured uh, pressure, which uh, uh, are very close to uh, each other. And you also see the temperature over here in red. Uh, you also see that the reaction time, so the time at high temperature and pressure, is actually very small in the range of uh, one millisecond. Uh, the point here uh, at the, let's say, uh, at the maximum compression is called the top dead center temperature and pressure uh, the pressure we could measure with a uh, with a sensor the temperature is calculated uh, by a uh, force balance model and an equation of state uh, what you should realize and which is very important to to mention is that the, the temperature over here is only the temperature of the gas uh, the reactor temperature is essentially much and much lower uh, let's say the same as in your car uh, engine now, here you can see some first results. Uh, uh, by varying the temperature, we could actually observe the uh, reaction network. Uh, so first producing the, uh, the C2s and the C3s. Uh, later on, we see the, uh, the, the benzene uh, up to the C8s coming up. That's the, uh, that's the triangles over here. And at the same time, also the TARS and the carbon uh, uh, comes up. So in this machine, we could actually observe the, uh, the, uh, the reaction network uh, shown in literature. A challenge that you have in this, in this reaction system is that we have very low concentrations of, of products uh, in the range of 0.5 to 2 volume percent, which is a large challenge for, uh, uh, for the separation section downstream. Now, uh, here you see some overall results. We compared the selectivity, the selectivity to C2 components uh, with other processes, OCM, oxidative coupling, and MCM. And what you can see over here in these charts, which show the selectivity versus the conversion of methane, uh, that this process can reach uh, very high selectivities at comparable yields uh, than the uh, other processes. Uh, the big advantage is, is that the reactor temperature that you can see over here in this scale uh, is much lower as compared to OCM and, uh, and NCM. So the first results we should say are, are rather promising of this, uh, of this technology. We are studying some kinetics, which I will only uh, uh, tell you about very briefly. It, it's work in, in progress. It, it's troubled uh, by the uncertainty concerning the, uh, the temperature. Uh, we know that the methane conversion is first order, and there seems to be uh, a function of the inert gas on the rate, uh, overall rate. But on this one, we will, we will report in, uh, in due time. Now, the other uh, alternative uh, that we studied, and about which I want to tell you a bit, is the uh, paralysis of methane to carbon and, and hydrogen, so the alternative to syngas production. Uh, so, uh, uh, using non-porous alumina particles actually to deposit the, uh, the carbon upon. We used small particles, uh, non-porous particles of 1.5 millimeter, and we used two different types of reactors, a single particle uh, reactor. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, over here, which is actually just a, uh, a particle floating in a, uh, in a gas uh, stream. We use that one for, to study kinetics, the kinetics of carbon deposition, and we use the fixed bed, uh, and uh, we tried to, to see if predictions from kinetics obtained in a single particle reactor could actually uh, describe uh, the results obtained in the, uh, in the fixed bed. Now, here we see some interesting results. That's the effect of temperature on, on carbon deposition. 
uh, you see the carbon uh, loading expressed in, in grams per square meter of, uh, of surface, of external surface, versus the uh, reaction time in this graph over here. And you see that uh, in time, the, uh, the loading increases, of course, as expected. But we also see that there is a maximum loading. Uh, after some time, the loading of carbon on such a particle does not further increase. Uh, and at this point of, of, of maximum loading, uh, also there is no methane conversion uh, anymore. So that's at the end of the, uh, of the conversion regime. At the start of the reaction, we saw that there is some activation uh, period. Uh, and in this period, uh, there is uh, no methane uh, deposited. And you can see this best from the, uh, from the, from the uh, data at 1,000 degrees C, so the red uh, circles over here. So in the first uh, hundreds of seconds, there is no methane, no methane deposition. But at that point, methane is already converted, but it is converted uh, not completely down to carbon and hydrogen, but uh, it's, it, 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 uh, let's say in the reaction pathway, we remain at, uh, let's say, benzene and higher uh, hydrocarbons. So no methane deposition uh, at this point. What we also saw is that the rate is proportional to the amount of alumina surface. So in an empty tube, uh, hardly any carbon is deposited if you put more and more of these particles in, uh, more carbon is deposited. Now we tried to explain this, uh, uh, to explain this behavior, and uh, we went into literature, and the first uh, model we, we encountered was a, a model described already in the early uh, 60s, which is a nucleation uh, model, uh, which actually says that uh, a surface uh, is initially not uh, activated and uh, at that time methane is also not able to interact uh, with this uh, surface and over time uh, these active sites uh, these potentially active sites are activated into nuclei uh, and the theory is that this happens because there is methane in the uh, in the surroundings uh, once you have such a nucleus uh, formed here in the second uh, uh, part of the graph um, uh, methane can start to grow and to deposit uh, on these nuclei and, uh, uh, and continue uh, to grow. The reaction stops, uh, like we also saw in the experimental results, uh, because at some point in time the nuclei are just consumed and uh, there is no nucleus left uh, to form any, no, any new methane uh, carbon layer on the, uh, on the surface. The next model we tried was a, uh, a model which is somewhat more simpler and also contains less uh, parameters. And that's a model that says, okay, in the gas phase, we don't have methane, but uh, benzene or uh, naphthalene, a higher uh, uh, hydrocarbon. And this can deposit on an active site, an active site of the, uh, of the surface. So, uh, uh, and at that point in time, uh, uh, it can also start to grow. So this, this, this carbon layer on the surface can start to grow. Uh, the theory is that this first step has a, uh, has a high activation energy, which then goes down as the carbon layer on the surface uh, increases. And at some point in time uh, uh, of the uh, carbon loading, the uh, uh, activation energy starts to increase again and goes to a very high value as a result of which the uh, reaction actually stops uh, and no carbon is uh, deposited uh, anymore. Because of this first initial step, you will understand that there is also this first activation time. Uh, so it takes some time before the reaction actually starts to deposit uh, carbon. Now, this graph you already saw, and here you can see that uh, these models are actually uh, able to describe the data we measured because uh, the, the, the symbols are the data points and the lines you can see over here are uh, fitted model results uh, through the uh, data of the single particle reactor. Now, of course, this is not that meaningful. Uh, what we tried if, uh, and that was a, an experiment in the fixed bed, we tried if uh, the kinetics uh, obtained in the single particle reactor could also uh, describe the results in the fixed bed reactor. 
in our fixed bed reactor, we could uh, measure the carbon loading at different points over the length of the reactor. These are these symbols over here. Uh, and we did that at several uh, times on stream, as you can see. And you can see that uh, both the uh, activation energy model and the nucleation model can describe these results uh, uh, very nicely. And uh, this is not a regression or a fit. This is a prediction because the kinetics were uh, obtained from a single particle reactor and these results are obtained in a fixed bed uh, reactor well my last slide uh, just a summary and some next steps uh, we think that this uh, methane conversion without the catalyst is an interesting process to to further investigate the, we have good yields and good selectivity and uh, high rates are possible there is quite a lot of interest from uh, at least the uh, the dutch industry uh, there are uh, many uh, challenges uh, remaining, also scientific challenges, and at the moment we are uh, studying these two uh, reaction systems uh, in continuous operation, and we hope to report on that in literature in a, in a few months. Uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker. And we have time for, uh, for a couple of questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, I stop sharing now. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Are there any questions from the audience? Not yet. Then may I ask some questions, maybe one yeah. or two. Yeah. Um, very interesting results. And uh, my question is, uh, what do you think about the possibility of scaling up and to, to what level? Uh, the process is like this. Uh, I mean, both uh, you mentioned pulse, um, pulse, ex pulse um, Russian, yeah. methodology and the, the methodology you uh, showed us with the decomposition of uh, methane. So what, what do you think about the possibility of scaling up this kind of processes? Well, the, I think we, we, we can do this. Uh, the, the pulse Compression system is an, is an engine, essentially, yeah? and you know that uh, uh, on ships we have engines with cylinders uh, uh, with diameters of a few uh, meters. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we should go that, that far, uh, but with, with industry we are now engaged in, uh, in scale-up uh, calculations uh, uh, showing that uh, yeah, uh, uh, if you compare this to a, to a NAFTAC wrecker, we can reduce the volume by about a factor of 10. Uh, compared to a NAFTA cracker. Uh, what I did not say, but uh, you will read about that soon, is that, uh, let's say, the frequency of the, of, the, of the engine is in the range of 50 hertz. And, and that's, of course, which makes it uh, uh, a very intensified process. The, the challenge uh, remains, and that's not my expertise, and for that we are working with mechanical engineers. Uh, this is a very, very tedious uh, design with respect to mechanical strength and uh, mechanical design. Uh, so th this calls for the co cooperation between mechanical engineers and, uh, and chemical engineers in the future, for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? No, and very short question and a very short answer, if possible. Uh, is it possible to combine two approaches? Or, I mean, to use catalyst, some kind of catalyst, Combined with the uh, with the pulse uh, approach. Sure, yeah, uh, we are doing that, and, and uh, I'm calling it non-catalytic. The question is, is that true? Because the, uh, we we think that there is for sure some effect of the steel wall of the uh, mm -hmm. of the yep. reactor, yeah. and yep. we are now engaged in a study to to change the material of the walls of the reactor, and we do see some results. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Let's thank the speaker again. And uh, we, we proceed to the next presentation, which is from the Polytechnical of Milano. And uh, the presenter will be a PhD student, Luca Nardi. Uh, are you with us? Uh, yes. Yes, very good. The screens are yours. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
good morning. Uh, today I'm going to present uh, our work that is uh, uh, the connecting investigation of uh, the CO2 activation via the reverse water gas shift reaction on uh, uh, rhodium catalyst. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the average concentration of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere has seriously increased in, uh, due to the anthropogenic CO2 emissions in the last centuries. And this increase has led to an increase in the average temperature of the Earth. The increase of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is due to, a different, to the difference between the time scale of the consumption of CO2 by natural cycle and the production of CO2 by the use of the feedstocks. Indeed, the feedstocks have been created in thousands, millions of years while we are using this feedstock in a very short time compared to the to the creation. Hence, uh, there is the need of speeding up the CO2 uh, uh, reduction to valuable chemicals to calibrate these time scales. Uh, one of uh, the possible routes is to re reduce uh, the uh, CO2 uh, back to, um, to um, reduced uh, carbon uh, forms uh, such as uh, carbon monoxide uh, or methane or methanol. In these works, uh, we are focused on the reverse water gas shift reaction. So uh, on uh, the uh, consumption of CO2 and hydrogen to give uh, uh, carbon monoxide and, uh, and water. Uh, carbon monoxide is a fundamental building block of the chemical industry and uh, it's used for a large variety of commodities. And uh, uh, hence, uh, we are operating at uh, temperature and pressure uh, that where uh, we uh, don't have the formation of other products. So we have one percent selectivity on carbon monoxide. Uh, in, uh, um, there is debate on which is the root concerning the mechanism that leads from CO2 to CO. Uh, generally, we can distinguish between three main mechanisms, the uh, uh, formate pathway, uh, the uh, carbon, the CO2 dissociation pathway and the uh, carboxyl pathways. But there is still uh, a debate about uh, which is the pathway, does it depend on the operating condition and uh, which is the transition state. Uh, in the next slides, I'm going to present, uh, first of all, uh, briefly, the methods used uh, in this work uh, from the point of view of experiments. Uh, then the experiments, um, um, the, the results of, the, of some of the experiments. And uh, uh, finally, we will have a mechanistic, mechanistic interpretation of uh, uh, the observations. Uh, from the point of view, from, um, the, the experiments have been carried out in a nanolar reactor. Uh, which uh, uh, is shown here. Uh, the reactor is made of a, um, of a annular stick, which is uh, uh, concentrically placed in, the, in, a, in a tube and uh, forming a annular cross section, which is uh, thin uh, with a, a section of which is 0 0.5 millimeters. And uh, uh, moreover, uh, on the stick, there is the catalyst, which is deposited by, by means of a deep coating technique. The catalyst used in this work is a 4% rhodium uh, on alumina. And uh, uh, this, uh, the deep coating allows to have a, a very thin layer, uh, considering the 10 milligrams, we have less than 10 micrometers of, uh, of catalyst layer on the, on the, on the, on the stick. Uh, this configuration allows to have, uh, from, first of all, um, uh, avoid external and internal transport limitations. And uh, moreover, uh, we have low pressure drops, and uh, uh, we are capable also of measuring the, the profile of temperature thanks to a thermocouple placed inside the uh, alumina tube. And hence, uh, this, this configuration is quite ideal, ideal for uh, kinetically relevant data and kinetic analysis. Uh, here, uh, we have uh, uh, some uh, of the results. Uh, and uh, in uh, these slides, uh, there are the, the, the it, we, I'm, I'm showing the effect of the variation of the partial pressure of the reactants, CO2 and hydrogen, on uh, the uh, conversion of uh, uh, the reactants. Uh, on the left, uh, we, there is the conversion of hydrogen uh, versus the partial pressure of CO2. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, blue squares 
uh, are data taken at 600 SQPs and 2.5% of hydrogen fixed concentration. Uh, the red uh, triangles are, take, are data taken at 5% hydrogen concentration fixed and 600 Celsius degrees. And the uh, green data, uh, green circles are uh, data taken at 700 Celsius degrees and 2.5% per, uh, percent of hydrogen. The dashed lines uh, represent the thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, it is visible that uh, as the partial pressure of CO2 increases, uh, the conversion of the reactant hydrogen that is constant uh, in all these experiments, uh, it uh, um, increases, uh, uh, which means that the CO2 has a significant effect on the conversion of the, of the reactants uh, towards, the uh, towards the products. And this uh, is, is, is uh, valid for all the three uh, different uh, uh, starting operating conditions. Uh, on the right, there is the uh, effect of uh, the um, hydrogen, uh, which uh, um, is shown by means of a conversion of CO2 versus the partial pressure of hydrogen. Uh, and uh, uh, again, we have uh, uh, three different uh, starting operating conditions, which are 2.5% uh, CO2 at 600 Celsius degrees, 5% CO2 at 600 Celsius degrees, 2.5% CO2 at 700 Celsius degrees. Again, dashed lines represent the thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, here, instead, it is visible uh, that uh, hydrogen has, a, has an effect on the uh, conversion of the, the, fixed, uh, con, the fixed reactant CO2 uh, at, 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 uh, until a certain point, where instead it starts to not have almost a, a practically a negligible effect. Uh, so, um, and compared, in, indeed, compared to CO2, we can see that CO2 has a greater effect compared to hydrogen, especially at high uh, concentration. That means uh, a high ratio between hydrogen and CO2. Uh, in this slide, instead, we have the effect of the products on the, uh, uh, on the conversion of the reactants. Uh, these uh, uh, data have been provided by means of co-feeding uh, um, each product, uh, respectively, uh, with uh, um, a starting 5% uh, CO2 and 5% hydrogen um, in that concentration of the reactants. Uh, on the left, we can see the uh, effect of the CO, uh, partial pressure on the conversion of the reactants. Uh, and uh, uh, we have the data at 600 Celsius degrees and 700 Celsius degrees. And we can see that uh, at, uh, by increasing the pressure pressure of CO, we have an negligible effect on the conversion, uh, both at 600 and 700 Celsius degrees, even at, lar at large, quite large partial pressure of CO considering that we are, we are, we are feeding 5% uh, 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 concentration of the reactants. Uh, on the right, uh, we can see uh, the effect of uh, water on the conversion of the reactants. And uh, it is visible that, the, uh, again, uh, similar to CO, uh, we can see that water has practically no effect on the conversion of the, reactant, uh, of the reactants, both at 600 Celsius degrees and 700 Celsius degrees. The data uh, shown until now were uh, um, experimental data uh, coming directly from the, from the plant, obviously. So uh, the data are uh, the conversion data. Uh, from experimental point of view, uh, we, we consider an reactor, we know what comes in, we know the inlet composition, we know the outlet composition, the, but we, 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 can't, uh, uh, we don't have um, uh, something that measures directly the rate of a, of a, of a, of a reaction. Uh, so we have to, to, to pass by through a model. Uh, considering the um, hypothesis made based before, the design of the reactor and the absence of, uh, uh, of, of transport limitations, we are in chemical regime and we can uh, model the reactor as a 1D ideal PFR, uh, which, uh, whose, mass, whose mass balance is here. Uh, then uh, from my experiments, uh, we have seen that the, along the catalyst bed, there is a um, thermal gradients are negligible. So we can, we can avoid to uh, introduce the uh, temp temperature, uh, uh, the, the, the energy balance. Um, then uh, as a first approximation to calculate the rate, we can assume that these differentials to, uh, be, to be a finite difference, considering that the rate does not change much along, this, uh, along the reactor in these experimental conditions. And so the, the, the net rate is, uh, uh, um, can be calculated from this uh, equation. 
And uh, this rate is the net rate. So it considers us uh, the forward rate minus the backward rate. Uh, since we want to measure only the forward rate, we have to approach to, to correct from, with the approach for to equilibrium, uh, like, in, like shown in this, uh, uh, by this equation, where eta is, uh, is shown here. The following rates have been elaborated considering these hypotheses. And here uh, we are showing, uh, I'm showing uh, the rates, uh, forward rates of the uh, reverse water gas shift reaction at, at varying partial pressure of CO2 on the left, with a 2.5% hydrogen fixed uh, uh, at the inlet at 600 and 700 Celsius degrees. Uh, we can see clearly here, more clear than before, uh, that uh, the rate is a, um, is a um, that the, the, the pressure pressure of CO2 has a positive effect on the rate of the reverse water gas sheet reaction, with, uh, uh, with, with which what we, we can say that is a practical forced order, uh, a forced order dependence. Uh, on the left, on the right, there is uh, instead the effect of hydrogen uh, at the fixed 2.5% CO2 concentration and 600 and 700 Celsius degrees. And uh, uh, we can see that at increasing partial pressure, it is uh, more clear again that uh, the, the forward rate of the, uh, of the reverse water gas shift reaction is influenced uh, at the low partial pressure of hydrogen until it reaches uh, practically a sort of plateau uh, where uh, there is no more an influence of the partial of the uh, hydrogen concentration on the rate on the forward rate of the reverse water, water gas shift reaction. This uh, is visible also uh, when we consider experiments taken at 5% uh, fixed uh, hydrogen concentration and 5% fixed CO2 concentration, at varying, uh, respectively at varying uh, partial pressure of CO2 and varying partial pressure of hydrogen. On the left, we can see that uh, CO2 is practically clearly a first order dependent, uh, is a first order, is a first order um, for this. Uh, uh, for the reverse water gas sheet reaction, while on the right, we can see that, again, we have uh, an effect of hydrogen, a small concentration of, of hydrogen, and then we tend to have um, uh, uh, no more an effect of the hydrogen on the rate. Um, so we have a sort of 0.5 order until here, and then we start to have a, a zero order uh, on, on hydrogen from the, um, on, the, on this reaction. Considering then the products, uh, we can uh, uh, see uh, that um, um, it is uh, again very, it is very, very verified that uh, there is uh, uh, practically no effect of the products on the reaction rate. On the left, there is the effect of CO on the forward reaction rate of the reverse water gas sheet reaction at 600 and 700 Celsius degrees, and it is visible that the rate is practically constant ag um, along uh, all the operating conditions. On the right, there is the effect of the, of the hydrogen uh, on the uh, rate of the reverse water gas sheet reaction. And we can see again that the practically there is uh, no effect of hydrogen uh, on the forward rate of the reaction along the uh, uh, operating condition uh, considered in this, in this work, both at 600 and 700 Celsius degrees. Uh, considering the data shown, we can come to uh, for the following conclusion, the following general conclusion. CO, uh, this, the reaction ratio is a first order dependence on CO2. Uh, hydrogen order seems to um, is, uh, um, is a 0 0.5 until a concentration, a, a, a concentration, um, a high concentration where it starts to be uh, a zero order. It's the other start to, to, have, to have no more effect on the, on, on the forward rate of the reaction. Moreover, the products, uh, CO and uh, water, have no effect on the reaction rate, so they have ordered zero considering, considering the, the reaction rate. Uh, on the left, we can see uh, the possible mechanism presenting at the, at the, at the beginning. Uh, this mechanism, uh, are, by the way, um, a simplified vision because uh, we are just following the CO2 reduction to CO. Uh, from the, if we, um, on, on the right, if we, it is presented the, uh, instead the full uh, CO2 dissociation pathway, that is the uh, orange one, and the full uh, CO2 um, carboxyl formation pathway, that is the, that is the, um, the light blue one. It is visible uh, by in here that uh, these, mechanism, these mechanisms are quite uh, interconnected, having a, a, a part of the intermediates uh, uh, that are uh, the same. 
considering the data shown, we could uh, um, see that, say that um, as the gene concentration increased, the reduction rate was dependent, uh, suggesting that the mechanism followed this pathway, the, form the carboxyl formation pathway, um, where we can assume these are the S, these are the tannin step. And uh, uh, by the way, at a certain point, uh, we, can, we could assume that instead there, is, there, there would be this uh, red determining step. So the, 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 the mechanism would follow what would, would be the, um, uh, carbon, uh, the CO2 dissociation pathway. Because uh, at uh, a certain point, uh, at high hydrogen concentration, there was not anymore the, um, the dependence on, on the rate on hydrogen. Uh, as a whole, the two mechanisms we can assume that are both present with CO2 dissociation being uh, preferred as also uh, as consistent with the FT calculation in, uh, in present in the, presented in the literature for podium. Uh, but at small hydrogen concentration, um, the, um, the carboxyl pathway uh, plays a role on this mechanism. Uh, in, 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 indeed, uh, it does, uh, um, indeed, at small hydrogen concentration, the carboxyl pathway um, is uh, uh, pushing the, uh, the reaction until a certain point where uh, the speed uh, of, 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 uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this path uh, becomes equilibrated and it's not anymore kinetically re re relevant. Obviously, uh, it, does not, it does not mean that it's not present. We are just, um, I'm just saying that it is uh, not, kinetically not, more, not any more relevant because it is uh, thermodynamically equilibrated. And the reaction from the point of view of the kinetics is ruled then at high hydrogen concentration by uh, the uh, CO2 dissociation pathway. Uh, so this means that, uh, that uh, seen, uh, vice versa, when we have a high concentration of CO2, so high ratio between CO2 and hydrogen, we will push more on this uh, on the pathway on the carboxyl formation pathway than on the uh, CO2 dissociation pathway. Uh, to conclude, uh, we have identified uh, the mechanism of the, of the reverse photogas shift reaction as not univocal but made of two different mechanisms, which uh, are uh, more important or less depending on the uh, operating condition, on the concentration of the reactants. At, uh, uh, the actual overall mechanism depends on the CO2 over hydrogen ratio. Well, uh, one, when we have a high CO2 over hydrogen concentration ratio, that is uh, vice versa, a, high, a low hydrogen over CO2, over CO2 um, ratio, uh, the carboxyl formation pathway uh, plays a role uh, from the point of view of kinetics. Uh, while uh, when we have a high, um, a low uh, CO2 over uh, hydrogen ratio or uh, vice versa, a high hydrogen over CO2 ratio, the carboxyl pathway is equilibrated and uh, we are kind of kinetically, we just see the uh, CO2 dissociation pathway. But by the way, these two pathways coexist uh, with, um, with uh, the prevalence of one or other depending on the, on the operating conditions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker. But um, uh, the time for your presentation is almost over because you used almost 20 minutes for your for your talk so uh let's uh let us the the the, the audience to ask uh, questions privately from the website or from from the email so we have to proceed to the next presentation and um i would like to invite the next speaker who is dr lauren van der Walle from uh from uh, Ghent University. It will be a presentation from two institutions. And since uh, two first uh, speakers changed the titles of the uh, presentations, I would not announce the next one. Maybe it, it was also changed. So please introduce your, in, in your talk. The, the screen is yes, yours. Yes, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, hello everyone, thank you for, for joining this talk. So today I will be talking about CFD simulation of decoking of industrial steam packing reactors. Um, well, this work was originally performed by a former colleague of me, which is Moreno Geertz, and he defended his PhD earlier this year, and he worked in collaboration with BASF and is now actually working for BASF. 
And so he couldn't attend the presentation, uh, the, the conference himself, which is why I will be presenting, presenting instead of him. So that being said, uh, let's go to the introduction of my talk. Yeah, okay. So as you probably all know, uh, steam cracking is nowadays the, the primary process for the production of linolefines, such as uh, ethylene and propylene, which are the base building blocks for all kinds of chemicals and uh, consumer goods. Now, steam cracking is a very endothermic process, and it's typically performed in large gas-fired furnaces. So you can see a picture of such a furnace in the middle of the slide. Schematically, such a furnace looks like this. So we have um, natural gas fuel, which is being burned uh, to provide the heat to the furnace. And then on the process side, we have our hydrocarbon feed stream that is mixed with steam, heated in the furnace, and uh, as such cracked into our olefin uh, products. Um, so in this talk, I will uh, focus on what happens in uh, the reactor tubes that are hanging inside the radiant section of this uh, furnace. Now, a well-known problem in these tubes is coke formation. Um, and this coke formation, it results in uh, reduced thermal efficiency. Uh, it also causes uh, an increase in the pressure drop, which in turn leads to a loss of product selectivity. And eventually, it can even lead to coil uh, carburization and thermal stresses. So that's why uh, steam cracking furnaces typically have to be shut down very frequently for decoking, uh, which is, of course, uh, yeah, bad for the overall efficiency of, of the process. So a lot of efforts uh, are being uh, formed to find uh, methodologies to reduce uh, coke formation in these steam cracking tubes. And one such technique is using a three-dimensional coil geometry. So you see a few examples here on the left. Uh, now these 3D geometries, they enhance the heat transfer from the furnace to the process site. And this leads to lower uh, wall temperatures, which in turn leads to uh, lower coking rates and thus uh, yeah, lower coke formation. Now in a previous work, we have already uh, investigated uh, coke formation inside these uh, three-dimensional uh, geometries. So we developed a CFD method to uh, simulate coke formation and investigate uh, this coke formation in 3D geometry. So this work was presented at Chem Reactor in London, uh, which is now five years ago. Um, and what we did here is we uh, compared three uh, reactor geometries, so a bare tube, a thin tube, and a ripped tube, in an industrial uh, millisecond propane cracker uh, configuration. And we found that as a function of the time on stream, for all the geometries, we could actually see a, a similar increase uh, in the tube metal temperature. Uh, but for the 3D geometries, the uh, absolute uh, TMTs were significantly lower because of the increased heat transfer. Uh, and this resulted, of course, in a longer run length until the maximum allowable PMT was reached. And for pressure drop, for all geometries, pressure drop increases along the run because of the reduction in cross-sectional area when the coke is growing. Uh, but we saw that for the continuous ripped geometry, this pressure drop was less fast compared to the other geometries, although initially it actually had the highest pressure drop. So from these simulations, we concluded that the ripped tube uh, actually outperformed the other geometries, uh, both on temperature and the pressure aspect. Now, in this follow-up work that I will present now, we are interested in uh, seeing how these 3D geometries behave during the decoking of the reactor, which follows the coking process that was in, uh, investigated here. Um, so for that, since both the, the, the coke uh, formation framework and the decoking de framework is heavily based on mesh generation. I will first explain a bit how we actually generate the mesh for these uh, CFD simulations. So at the basis is actually the observation that these 3D geometries, all of them, or at least all the ones that we are interested in, they can be described by a parametric equation, which gives the radial position of the tube surface as a function of the angular coordinates. Um, so that is the basis of the entire methodology, basically. So what we do to mesh this is we start from a cylindrical uh, base mesh uh, 
in the core of the of the of the geometry and then for every point on this cylindrical surface we can actually calculate the distance from that point to the uh, to the surface of our 3d geometry so by using this uh, parametric equation it's easy to calculate the delta r uh, between the cylinder surface and the 3d geometry surface so then for every point on the cylinder surface, we can extrude over this delta R to create actually a fluid region uh, of our geometry. And then since we also want to simulate the uh, heat transfer in the metal tube wall, we need to extrude a second time to a fixed uh, radial coordinate, which is the outer uh, radius of our tube geometry. So here I have shown it for a FIND reactor, but we have actually developed these extrusion models for various 3D coil geometries that are typically used in steam cracking furnaces. So we have a FIND reactor, rib reactor, dimples, um, the, an advanced rifled tube, and even a swirl flow tube. So with this mesh generation, that mesh generation concept in mind, it's actually pretty straightforward to extend this to a uh, way to introduce coke formation. So if we want to simulate uh, coke layer growth, basically let's assume that we have a certain uh, thickness of our coke that is being deposited in a certain uh, discrete time step delta t. Uh, then we again start from the same cylindrical base mesh, but instead of extruding all the way to the original surface, we now just subtract the thickness of the coke uh, layer. And then, uh, so we extrude over this reduced delta R, then we extrude the coke region over the thickness of the coke region, and again, we add our metal region. So this was for, for coking. Uh, now let me explain how we use this in our decoking methodology. So for that, we start actually from a simulation where coke is already deposited. So this is the end simulation of our previous work. And then we change the, the conditions of the simulations to decoking conditions. So decoking conditions means that we will add steam and air as our reactants to burn off the coke. Uh, we will fix an inlet temperature and an outlet pressure, uh, and we will fix a certain furnace temperature. And with these conditions, we perform a steady state simulation. Uh, so we run a simulation uh, to uh, steady states uh, values at the outlet. And during the simulation, we uh, take into account two decoking reactors. So this is a combustion reaction and a steam gasification reactions. And these are both surface reactions. So we incorporate these in the simulations by adding a source term in the first cell near the gas coke interface. So we run the simulation to steady state. Then we evaluate uh, the, the outlet temperature. And if this outlet temperature is what we want, then we can move on to the next step. If not, we update our furnace temperature. So basically the furnace temperature is always dynamically updated to until we reach a certain oil outlet temperature. So this is equivalent with what they do in industry. So they fix the outlet temperature and they will adjust the firing rate to their burners. Um, so then, and, when we still have coke present, at this point, we will actually uh, calculate the thickness of the coke layer that has to be removed. So we take uh, the decoking rate that uh, corresponds to the steady state simulation. We assume a fixed delta T over which we assume that this uh, decoking rate is constant. And as such, we can calculate the thickness of the coke layer that have to be removed. Then we perform a mesh update in the same way as explained on the previous slide. So again, we start from the same cylindrical mesh, but now we adjust the extrusion distance to also account for the uh, thickness of the cokes that can be removed again. And then we add the remaining coke layer and we extrude again the metal region. So we do this procedure until basically all the cokes is removed and then we can say our simulation is finished. So that's for the methodology. Now let's see. Uh, Let's go to the results. Um, yeah, and first, maybe yeah, the operating conditions. So we did this for the same uh, geometries as were simulated earlier so in our previous work. So again, the pair reactor, uh, fin reactor, and a ripped reactor. Uh, we did this for a millisecond furnace setup, uh, which has these characteristics. And the initial coke layer came for, from our earlier work. Um, the decoking policy uh, was actually the same as what is industrially applied, or this was based on an industrial 
the applied methodology, uh, which means that um, during the entire decoking process, the inlet temperature, the outlet temperature, and the outlet pressure are fixed. Also, the steam flow rate is fixed, but at uh, after three hours and after eight hours of decoking, our air flow rate to, is, uh, is increased to boost the decoking process. And in these simulations, we assumed a fixed uh, time step for the mesh update of half an hour. So every half an hour in the scheme, we basically adjust uh, the mesh. So these are the results for the bare tube. So on the left, you see the evolution of the coplayer thickness profile as a function of decoking uh, time. Uh, so the initial profile is what is what was resulting from our earlier work. So you see here the thickness of the coplayer as a function of axial coordinate. And uh, during decoking, we see that the thickness uh, gradually uh, reduces. And we also see that uh, decoking front shifts further uh, downstream. So uh, decoking uh, is fastest in the beginning of the reactor where the concentration of oxygen and uh, steam is still high, and then it gradually reduces. So here we see the overall decoking rate over the entire tube uh, as a function of time. So in general, it is always decreasing as a function of time because more and more coax is burned off. But after three hours, when we increase the, uh, the oxygen uh, flow rate, there is a sudden increase, a sudden boost in the decoking rate uh, because of the very fast combustion chemistry. We can also see in this scheme that, uh, in general, the decoking rate due to combustion is much higher than that due to steam gasification, um, which basically indicates that in this specific case, uh, the water or the steam is just there as a dilution agent rather than really a reactant to burn off the coax. Um, this is actually showing a similar um, information as what is seen here. So we see that the decoking rate, uh, decoking front is actually shifting further downstream uh, when uh, decoking proceeds. Um, and the sudden boost in, in decoking rate at the beginning of the reactor is also um, corresponding to a very uh, steep increase in the temperature at this point because of the exothermicity of this combustion, co-combustion reaction. So that we see here. Uh, so this is a plot of the uh, coke metal interface temperature as a function of the axial position and it's for different times during decoking. So we see that there is always a sudden peak or, or a sudden increase in the temperature uh, at the position of the decoking front. And since we are keeping our outlet temperature uh, fixed, uh, this means that our furnace temperature needs to be gradually updated. Uh, so overall, the furnace temperature is actually always relatively uh, constant, except, of course, if we start playing with our operating conditions. So once we add more oxygen and there is more exothermic reactions happening, we need less furnace heat uh, to get the same CO2. And then um, once our coke is removed, we no longer have this uh, exothermic reactions anymore. So we need, again, uh, to fire our uh, furnace a bit more to get the same oil outlet temperature. So these were the results for the pear tube. Then have a look at let's have a look at uh, the fint tube. So here you see uh, the temperature uh, profile in the fin and also the thickness of the, the coke layer in these fins um, as a function of the different yeah the decoking uh, time. Uh, what is immediately apparent is that uh, there is actually very little gradients uh, in temperature in, in the spin. And this is in sharp contrast with what we see at the end of uh, the run during a cracking cycle. So at the end of a cracking cycle, actually in these fins, it's, uh, yeah, it's common that there are temperature variations up to 50 degrees C, both in the coke layer and in the metal region. Um, and given that this is not present in decoking during decoking, this means that when we shift from coking to decoking, there is actually a very high risk of uh, thermal stresses, which can cause cracks in the tube wall, especially where the wall is thinnest, so in these uh, fin valleys. And that's actually also something that they observe industrially. Uh, so using the simulations, we could actually try to, to reduce this uh, or to already have some idea there. Uh, if we look at the furnace temperature, we see that for the Fint reactor, we always need an 
a smaller furnace temperature to the to the to get the same as coil outlet temperature, we, which is because we have a better uh, heat transfer in these three D geometries. Uh, but of course, if we have a, a higher, uh, better heat transfer, we also have lower wall temperatures, and this results in lower decoping rates. So there's a bit of a trade-off. So the reason why these three D geometries are good during the cracking cycle is not necessarily a good thing during the decoping cycle. Um, then finally, look at let's look at the, the ripped tubes. So here for the ripped tube, uh, we saw that always at the trailing edge of the rip, we saw that uh, the decoking rates are always much lower than at uh, uh, the, the other side of the of the rip, which is because there is a huge uh, a recirculation uh, zone just downstream of the rip, um, and because of that, there will always some there will always be some coke left uh, at the trailing edge of the, of, of the rip, and this can uh, lead to some cokes falling, um, which is also not really what we want. So again, for this rip tube, we saw that much lower furnace temperatures were needed to get the same uh, coil outlet temperature, uh, again, because of these uh, better heat transfer in, uh, in these 3D geometries. And this is at the, uh, yeah, and the downside of this is again the lower decoking rates, uh, which means that we would actually need to decoke for a longer time to uh, get all the cokes off. So this clearly indicates that there's still a lot of opportunity to further optimize the decoking process, especially for these uh, 3D geometries. So it's not sufficient just to use uh, decoking policies that are used for bare tube reactors. Then the final simulation we did was just a test to see what happens if we use pure air as a decoking agent, so without steam. Um, now, if we do that, uh, yeah, ignition occurs and it's basically impossible to control the coil outlet temperature. Uh, so with these simulations, instead of controlling the coil outlet temperature with the furnace temperature, we just uh, fix the furnace temperature and uh, looked at what happens. So at the start of decoking with pure air, we already uh, see a 26 times higher decoking rate, and this for a 75K uh, lower furnace temperature. Um, so these high temperatures, they can really uh, endanger coil integrity. Uh, so polymerization and even melting can occur at these temperatures. Um, so similar simulations, they can help to further optimize the industrial decoking process specifically for these three uh, coil geometries. And this brings me to the conclusions of my presentation. So uh, we developed a CFD framework to examine decoking of 3D steam cracking coil geometries. Um, and we showed that in the 3D geometries, uh, lower furnace temperature, so less firing, less CO2 formation uh, eventually is needed uh, to get the same COT. Uh, but this is uh, also uh, to, comes with a lower decoking rates and their end risk of spalling, risk of thermal stresses. Uh, we investigated the possibility for air only decoking, but this resulted in an acceptably high tube metal wall temperatures. And overall, the main conclusion is that there's still a lot of opportunity to further optimize the decoking process. And we hope that the tool that we developed uh, can be uh, used for this. Uh, so that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I would like to acknowledge all these funding agencies and of course my colleagues, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. If there are. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker. Uh, unfortunately, you also used all 20 minutes for your for your presentation. So uh, I would ask the, the, the audience to ask uh, questions privately if there are any. So thank you very thank much you. again. And we have to proceed to the next presentation, which will be given from uh, two institutions from Novosibirsk, Russia. And um, the, the talk will be given by Dr. Nadezhda Vernikovskaya. And uh, please announce your, the title of your presentation yourself for the reason I, I announced before. Thank you. Uh, good day, dear colleagues. Uh, is everything? Okay. Mm -hmm. We can, we can uh, hear you and see your presentation. Uh -huh. one, one moment. Uh -huh. uh, a feature of catalytic microchannel reactors is a great number of uh, submillimeter channels. Uh, 
Uh, this provides a high specific surface area uh, and eliminates intraparticle diffusion limitation when the catalyst is depos deposited on the walls of the channels or when the channels uh, are filled with the fine particles. Uh, the absence of large void fractions, uh, fraction in reactor and the um, affecting storing of reagents lower the risk of formation of uh, hot and cold spots. Uh, intensive uh, heat uh, transfer creates near the thermal conditions, even for uh, reactions with a strong heat release. Uh, this increases the selectivity for, for desired products. And by raising the concentration of reagent, uh, improved catalytic performance can be obtained. Uh, the laminar uh, flow uh, for the reagent in the small length of the channels provide uh, a uniform distribution of uh, gas velocity. Uh, Microchannel reactors can be easy uh, scaling up. Uh, nitrous oxide is commonly used uh, in uh, medicine, uh, in food industry, in transport vehicles, uh, in, uh, for production of valuable chemical substances. And uh, for development uh, of uh, processes with the participation of nitrous uh, oxide requ requires the scale of uh, its production to be increased. This cannot be done with uh, the existing meaning of industrial nitrous oxide production by the thermal, um, by the thermal uh, decomposition of ammonia nitrate. A promising way uh, is the selective catalytic oxidation of um, ammonia with oxygen. Uh, the high exothermicity of the process and the need to, to effectively remove heat from the reaction zone require, uh, requires, requires the development of new reactors. Uh, the nitrous oxide pr production uh, in the Alfox process on oxide manganese business uh, catalysts with high activities and selectivities, uh, was developed in fluidized bed and uh, fixed bed reactors. Uh, and for low capacity uh, production, it is uh, not necessary to use uh, large fluidized bed reactors. Uh, and tubular reactors are preferable. However, in a tubular reactor, uh, the process conditions must be uh, strictly controlled in order to attain high nitrous oxide selectivity with minimal emission of uh, toxic nitrogen oxides. And the uh, catalyst uh, thermal stability and uh, explosion safety have to be considered. Uh, these factors restrict the possibility of using the tubal reaction. This restriction can be eliminated uh, by conducting the process in microchannel reactor. Uh, this may be promising uh, due to ability to operate uh, at high ammonia concentration, concentrations. Uh, so uh, the purpose of this work is to simulate the process of ammonia oxidation into nitrous oxide over manganese bismuth aluminum catalyst in a microchannel reactor to determine the process parameters that provide the maximum nitrous uh, oxide output with high process reliability and environmental safety. safety. Uh, the uh, multi-channel reactor uh, for the present study is a brass disc with uh, 52 uh, millimeter uh, disc with uh, 52 millimeters in, in, in diameter, uh, 10 millimeters in uh, height. Uh, there are 500 uh, uh, channels uh, in the central area of the disk. Uh, to save the computational time, uh, a sector with uh, surface equal to one twelfth uh, of the total geometric surface of the reactor was cut. Uh, the channels uh, and uh, the metal part represent uh, two computational domains with heat exchange between domains and simulation will conducted simultaneously in two domains. Uh, in the uh, first domain, um, the next item are uh, taken into account uh, convective heat and mass uh, transfer, effective diffusion and thermal conductivity, and catalytic reactions. There are mass balance equations, total mass balance, energy balance, 
and uh, boundary conditions, uh, in particular heat exchange between domains. Uh, in the second domain, the, um, thermal conductivity of the metal is, take, is taken into account. Uh, here is uh, uh, energy balance equations and boundary conditions, in particular uh, heat exchange between domains and uh, constant temperature at the edge of the reactor. There are two reactions, uh, uh, the nitrous oxide formation uh, and uh, formation of uh, nitrogen and uh, nitric oxide. Reaction rates depends on concentration of uh, ammonia, oxygen and water. Uh, the next parameters will um, vary uh, concentration of ammonia and simultaneously oxygen, concentration of water edge temperature and simultaneously inland temperature. Uh, temperature at the channels inland uh, at uh, constant edge temperature, linear velocity, metal heat conductivity and pressure. Uh, there is uh, one restriction. Uh, the maximum temperature in microchannel reactor should not exceed uh, 375 degrees centigrade. Uh, because uh, temperatures above this value, the selectivity to nitrogen oxide uh, 2 and 4 is higher than 0 0.95%. Uh, Assessed parameters uh, are ammonia conversion, selectivities to nitrous oxide and to byproducts, maximum temperatures in central channels and peripheral channels. Uh, for explanation, the uh, obtained results. Uh, term uh, thermal power is introduced, which is defined as uh, heat released during the reactions per second. It depends in, in particular on ammonia molar flow. Uh, in ammonia molar flow, the variation of uh, ammonia uh, concentration and linear velocity leads to uh, changes in ammonia molar flow and consequently in thermal power. On this slide, we can see uh, distribution of temperature and ammonia uh, conversion, uh, conversion and nitrous oxide selectivities. Uh, the temperature grows uh, at the inland of the channels due to exothermic reactions because of a heat transfer between the channels and the surrounding metals. The temperature falls inside the channels uh, and uh, raises, uh, rises between them. This is clearly seen in cross section uh, drawn in the zone of uh, maximal uh, temperatures. The heat from the central part of the disk is spread to uh, the periphery where the disk is pulled uh, to the edge temperature. Uh, the conversion of ammonia and nitrous oxide selectivity uh, are still small in here. Uh, uh, in outlet cross section, the temperature um, in the channels and between them is equalized. Um, average uh, conversion, average conversion uh, is 99.4% uh, and uh, average uh, nitrous oxide selectivity is 90.7%. Uh, uh, there is an uh, effect of uh, ammonia inland concentration on average uh, ammonia uh, conversion and, uh, and um, nitrous oxide selectivity and uh, maximal temperature in central channels and in periphery channels, central and periphery channels. On the one hand, uh, uh, increased concentration of ammonia and oxygen accelerates the, form the formation of nitrous oxide and byproducts. On the other hand, increased the inhibition of second uh, reaction uh, with oxygen and first with oxygen and ammonia decreases the conversion of ammonia and uh, reduces nitrous oxide selectivity. Both reactions are exothermic, uh, so the maximum temperature in the uh, channels uh, uh, grow due to growing the heat release uh, and the thermal power. Uh, here is uh, the uh, profile, uh, radial profiles of the maximal temperature in three, ch in three channels and uh, at the disk edge for three ammonia uh, concentrations. The difference between the uh, maximal temperature in the central channel uh, and uh, in the disk edge is uh, 
high for large value of ammonia concentration due to large thermal power in this case. Despite the drop in selectivity with increasing the concentration of ammonia, the nitrous oxide productivity grows from 18.4 to, uh, uh, to 86.8 uh, gram per cubic meter per second. Uh, here is uh, the effect of water. Uh, the rates uh, of ammonia oxidation and uh, into both nitrous oxide and uh, byproducts uh, fall as the content of water uh, grows. This reduces the conversion um, of ammonia and uh, the temperature of hot spots. However, we uh, can see a slight in, uh, increase in nitrous oxide selectivity. This increase was, uh, was observed experimentally in this works. And this works uh, also confirms the decrease in maximum temperature. Uh, this figure shows the effect of this edge temperature. An increase uh, in uh, edge temperature leads uh, to a growth in the temperature of entire disk due to disk heat conductivity. As a result, the temperature inside the channels uh, also grows. Uh, this increases uh, the rate of nitrous oxide formation and to a much uh, greater extent the rate of byproduct uh, formation due to high activation energy of these reactions. For this uh, uh, reason, uh, the ammonia conversion and the selectivity to nitrous oxide uh, um, grows, though the selectivity uh, grows uh, uh, more slowly compared to ammonia conversion. At um, the temperature uh, 370 degrees of centigrade, the uh, nitrous oxide productivity is 88.9 uh, gram per cubic meter per second, being uh, 1.3 by 1.5 times higher than the maximum possible calculated productivity of a fixed bed tubular reactor. Uh, there is the uh, effect of linear gas, gas temperature, uh, of inlet gas, gas temperature, uh, rising inlet uh, temperature had no meaningful effect on the uh, conversion and selectivity. Uh, this is explained uh, by the temperature in the channels uh, rising quickly to approach the edge temperature near the channel inland. Uh, there is the effect of linear gas velocity. Increasing the li linear velocity reduces the conversion and, uh, uh, of ammonia and selectivity. Uh, uh, conversion of ammonia because of the short residence time. Uh, the nitrous oxide selectivity also uh, drops. However, the maximum temperature in the channels uh, grows. This is exp explained by the uh, growing of ammonia molar flow and consequently thermal power. Uh, there is the effect of uh, material heat conductivity. And here is, uh, the thermal condition is established um, in the microchannel reactor, even when the reactor material has a re re relatively uh, low value. Uh, the maximum temperature in the central uh, channel and uh, uh, differ from the edge temperature uh, by less than 3.5 degrees of centigrade. An increase in thermal uh, conductivity uh, to 140 watt per meter per Kelvin reduces this difference. A further increase in, in thermal conductivity is no longer significant. Uh, however, if the thermal power, power increases uh, due to, uh, uh, for example, ammonia concentration and uh, linear velocity and the edge temperature, uh, the maximum temperature may exceed the maximum possible value. So, uh, correctly choosing a material with high uh, thermal conductivity for a specific reactor edge temperature allows us uh, to control the maximum temperature in the channels according to the catalyst thermal stability. Uh, so, we can make the next uh, conclusions. Microchannel reactors are characterized by intense uh, heat and mass transfer. 
they are for uh, matter chain reactor, uh, reactors are promising uh, for strongly the thermic reactions. It is profitable to use these reaction, reactors uh, for low tonnage production of nitrous oxide by selective oxidation of ammonia. The ammonia concentration can be uh, rise to 20%, which allows uh, a significant increase in nitrous uh, oxide output. And the conditions uh, were found to provide high ammonia conversion and nitrous oxide selectivity. The nitrous oxide output uh, reached uh, uh, 88.9 gram per cubic meter per second, which is higher than in uh, the tube of reactor. Uh, for a given reactor edge temperature, uh, increasing the linear velocity increases the ammonia molar flow, flow and consequently the same thermal power, despite reduction in the uh, residence time. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much. Uh, we have, let's thank the speaker first, and uh, we have some time for questions or comments. Other if, I, if I may, uh, I have two questions. Yes, please. Introduce yourself and ask uh, your questions. And I, I am Hasan Kuybush. I'm a PhD student in Bosch University. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the presentation, by the way. Uh, my first question is, which software did you use for this simulation? Mm -hmm. Uh, we use uh, the console multi-physics version uh, 5.4. Uh, thank you. And my second question is, there are two different domains uh, in your mesh. Uh, how does this interaction work between these two different domains? And did you use user-defined function or some kind of code to make the interaction between these domains, the thermal interaction? Uh, to, mm. We use two, two domains uh, in uh, uh, metal. In metal, uh, it was only an uh, um, equation for thermal conductivity, uh, mm -hmm. for temperature. Uh, in the channels, uh, it was uh, uh, equations for uh, species, for mass, mass balance equations, uh, and also energy equation. And between uh, them, it was uh, uh, heat exchange and uh, do you ask about mesh and uh, you don't understand uh, maybe correctly your question i mean in the uh, software setup um, for example in the ANSYS, uh, you have to clarify the interaction between the domains to make the thermal interactions possible for example uh, i was wondering if you use a specific user defined function or different methodology to quantify the thermal uh, interaction or heat that was transferred between these two domains? Uh, it was a uh, uh, heat exchange between domains. Uh, the function like this, uh, you know, when we were uh, in the channels, uh, uh, we uh, uh, have a heat exchange uh, like this equation uh, when we, we are in the uh, metal part. Oh, oh sorry, uh, if we, when we are in metal part, we have uh, this equation, heat exchange. When we uh, are in the uh, channels, we have uh, uh, the similar uh, equation, uh, the similar heat exchange between the domains, but uh, in op opposite direction. Okay, I, I understood. Sorry, uh, I was just wondering excuse how... Me, please, excuse me, please. Uh, we have to proceed to the next... Okay, okay sorry, sorry. So Th if, thank you. Uh, if, if possible, please uh, thank you. Uh, use the private communication to clarify if uh, some, uh, some questions or uncertainties uh, remain. So thank Okay, you. thank you. Let's thank the speaker mm -hmm. again. And we have to proceed to the next presentation, which will be given by... PhD student Abdesamaid Salfi. I'm sorry if I'm uh, if I pr um, pronouncing not correctly. From uh, Politecnico di Milano, from uh, two institutions from uh, from uh, Italy. Uh, and please announce uh, the the title of your presentation. And you, the screens are yours. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Do you do you hear me? Yes, yes, we did. Okay. Yes, we did. So I'm going to share my screen. Oh, 
Okay, so uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Abdesan Desaufi. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Politecnico di Milano. And uh, the title of my presentation is CFD modeling of the evaporation, auto ignition, and combustion of droplets of uh, phosphorus by oil surrogate components. Uh, this is uh, a work which was um, done uh, during a project, uh, like a couple of years ago, uh, within the Residue to Heat project, uh, whose aim was to develop uh, a way, uh, both from experimental point of view and from an American point of view, to produce uh, phosphorus by oil from, from biomass, and then use this oil for residential heating. Um, this was involving several universities uh, around Europe, and uh, the challenges were, were a lot because phosphorus by oil is very difficult to use because of its high viscosity and uh, the acidity that tends to corrode the, the pipes, for example, and the reactors, and, um, and the very complex mixture that actually uh, is uh, phosphorus by oil. So from an American point of view, uh, this was a challenge to model. So from the kinetic part, uh, we developed a surrogate for it since the mixture is, is very complex. So we need to uh, identify some molecules that actually can describe this kind of system. And uh, this was done uh, by part of the group in Politecnico di Milano. And in this presentation, we will focus on two uh, of these components of the surrogates, which are acetic acid and ethylene glycol. And uh, more specifically, uh, we had a collaboration with the university in Naples, um, which, has, which is not a university, it's a CNR in Naples, uh, concerning the experiments on single droplet evaporation and combustion of these uh, surrogate components. And this is a very interesting uh, topic because it allows to study the individual components of the surrogate and compare them with the, with the bio-oil behavior. The experimental device they have is, uh, is Pretty straightforward. They have a, a, a droplet suspended on a fiber, which is actually a thermocouple. And this droplet is heated from below by a coil, which is electrically heated. So you have a buoyancy driven flow, which is established that goes uh, upwards. And then uh, the droplet evaporation starts. And if the conditions are suitable, also a note ignition uh, occurs. So a combustion process will, will actually happen. And this is uh, like a scheme of the uh, experimental device, like from the geometrical point of view. And we have to model that from a CFD uh, point of view. So that's pretty complex to model because it's a full uh, 3D geometry. So we had to simplify it somehow um, to reduce size and to uh, be able to model this kind of system with an axisymmetric geometry instead of a full 3D one. Uh, Okay, so the computational domain that you actually have was built with uh, once it's fluent and is actually something like this. So it's just a 2D geometry that then is made axisymmetric to properly model the system. So you see the, uh, the coil here and uh, the very uh, refined mesh around uh, the place where the droplet would be, would be placed. And moreover, this is a multi-region grid. So we have a mesh for the fluid and the mesh for the solid, which are then coupled with uh, proper boundary conditions. Uh, the boundary conditions that we have on the fluid size are pretty straightforward. So we have open boundaries on all sides, on all sides. Uh, and as I already told you, we have a coupling between the solid and the fluid at the fiber. And then we have a boundary condition at the coil. Which is uh, which I will explain it later because it's a bit a little bit more uh, complicated. So the droplet will be placed inside that region and will be modeled with uh, an interface resolved simulation. So why that? Because uh, we have a lot of phenomena involved in this kind of system. We have convection, we have gravity, surface tension, uh, an interface which is not uh, a sphere but is actually deformable, and we have a velocity field inside. Uh, the liquid phase, so an internal circulation. So we cannot use what is actually traditionally used, so a spherical symmetric uh, model, uh, but we have to go towards a more uh, complicated and descriptive model. 
which is an interface resolved simulation. So it, it uses a CFD approach, so a full 3D geometry and momentum equation uh, should be written for it. And that it doesn't assume a uh, position, either neither a shape of the interface, but this uh, interface position is actually a function of the velocity field. Uh, we developed a code through uh, the last years, which is called Drop and Smoke, which is actually um, a multi-phase CFD uh, code for the uh, proper analysis of the evaporation and combustion of uh, isolated uh, droplets, either suspended by fiber under gravity or in microgravity. And this is based on a volume of fluid methodology where we have a function alpha, which is a scalar, uh, which is transported by the fluid flow, so an advection method. And then we have some specific source terms that I've, are applied to the interface to, uh, to model the, the, the evaporation rate. We have a momentum equation, which is a two-field momentum equation written for both fields. A uh, temperature equation to model the heat transfer between the liquid phase and the gas phase. And then, of course, we have species equation for each species that is present in this other system. And we also write that uh, with a two-field approach, so one for the liquid phase and one uh, for the gas phase. So the phase change, the phase change is derived by a simple consideration on the heat, on the mass transfer of the interface, including both diffusion and convection. And uh, the diffusion fluxes are, of course, uh, evaluated at the interface, uh, depending on the gradient of the vapor. And since we are transporting the species uh, field, we also, we also can uh, very easily compute the gradient of that field. And uh, it is applied at the interface by what is called a diffuse approach, where we uh, approximate the surface per unit volume uh, at a certain cell with a gradient of alpha, which is the uh, scalar function I was talking about. And no correlation is adopted to do that. So we don't use any semi empirical correlation to evaluate the evaporation rate because we actually solving uh, the boundary layer at the interface. So this structure of the code, you see on the left part, the uh, fluid, let's say, uh, section of the code, and on the uh, right part, the multi-region extension that accounts for the solid region. Uh, in order to do that, so I said that the coil is actually heating the droplet, and we have to reconstruct the heating rate on the droplet. So we have it from an experimental point of view, we have to reconstruct it from a numerical point of view. So we have to find the proper boundary condition that should be applied at the coil in order to have the same uh, profile that we get experiments. So this is actually what is uh, done. And we developed uh, an exponential function, which is very easy to uh, give at the coil, uh, which is in the geometry. And this experimental function has only one parameter that can be actually tuned to reconstruct or heating rate. So once we have the heating rate on the droplet, we can actually start our simulation. So from the sole point of view of the evaporation, this is uh, what happens. So we have the coil that uh, hits the droplet and the droplet that reduces its size uh, because of the evaporation process. This can be uh, compared with experimental results, uh, both considering and not considering the effect of the, of the fiber from the heat transfer point of view. And uh, as you see, the experimental decay is pretty well, uh, the experimental diameter decay is pretty well uh, captured um, if the fiber is considered. So if the fiber is not considered in the system, we have a slightly over prediction of the droplet lifetime, of course, because we have a preferential uh, path for the heat flux towards uh, the droplet that actually gets heated from the center. Uh, this is the same uh, argument we can use to, um, to see the temperature profile. So if I account for the fiber, I can, get, I can uh, predict the experimental results uh, better than uh, the case where the fiber is, is not accounted for. So actually the effect of fiber, uh, even if it's small, is actually not negligible. So it's important to use that multi-region uh, method uh, I was talking about. And the same arguments can be done for ethylene glycol. Of course, the experimental uh, diameter decay and the temperature are different because it's a different component of the surrogate of Pisparolis bioil. Uh, but more or less the physics is the same. So it's just the properties that change. And even in this case, we can uh, capture the experimental diameter decay and the temperature of the droplet with pretty good accuracy. 
and we can make some analysis on the thermal effect of the supporting fiber. And as you see here, this can uh, be uh, very important, especially at the initial conditions. So the initial flux can be can reach up to 40% of the total heat flux on the droplet if I compare it with the convection heat flux and with the uh, heat flux due to evaporation. So uh, we have to um, now study something about combustion because we are able to model the evaporation, uh, but combustion is more difficult because of the stiffness of a typical detailed combustion chemistry that have to be taken into account from an America point of view. We have to uh, insert somehow in the system the radiation and uh, detailed transport properties, coupled with the multiphase fluid dynamics that we already have. Uh, in order to do that, we developed um, an operator splitting methodology that we already use for simulating uh, laminar flames. Uh, so when you have a transport equation, you have a couple of terms, which are the transport and the source terms. You don't solve them together, but you actually split them over the same uh, time step in order to couple the chemistry, all the chemistry, and model the chemistry as uh, independent batch reactors for each cell of the computational domain. And we only do that for gas phase, so where alpha, so that's got a function is equal to zero. We include heat transfer, we include the evaporation model that uh, I already explained, and uh, a detailed kinetic mechanism for acetic acid, which includes 40 species and more than 400 reactions. Uh, the code is basically the same, we just extend it to include the chemistry. And uh, so this is how a typical combustion uh, um, uh, simulation looks like. So we have the coil which is hitting the droplet, the droplet auto ignites uh, in the gas phase and it forms a buoyant diffusion flame. So the ignition region is from the bottom of the droplet. As you see, the OH, OH radical, is, is, uh, which is actually very important for combustion, uh, is uh, on the lower part. So it gets ignited from the lower part and then we have the development of this uh, flame with a partial quenching at the fiber surface because, uh, because it's, a, it's a cold wall. Uh, we can see some product distribution in the mixture fraction space. So as you see, uh, water and CO2 are more or less the flame front, while the CO, which is formed, um, is actually completely oxidized at the flame front. So we only find it in the rich uh, region of the, of the gas mixture. And of course, the oxygen is totally depleted from the system. Uh, we can compare it with the experimental results we have about combustion. So as you see, uh, you, you, as you see, you have the experimental results, the evaporation simulation, and the combustion simulation. And combustion and evaporation are pretty much the same until ignition takes place. So after ignition, we have a, a much faster, uh, of course, reduction of the droplet size, and then um, a more uh, reliable, reliable agreement with the experimental results. Uh, so the faster um, droplet consumption is due to the higher temperature, of course, that we have because of the flame, and because we actually consume the fuel uh, in the gas phase, and this increases the, the, the gradient, so the evaporation rate towards the gas phase. Uh, if we compare the ignition time and the diameter uh, ignition with the experimental results, we can get pretty good analysis, which are confirmed by a uh, mesh um, refinement analysis. And same thing can be done for ethylene glycol. So here we get a pretty not very good experimental um, not very good agreement with the experimental results, but still we can see the same thing. So that uh, compared with evaporation, we have a much faster uh, droplet consumption. And still the ignition time and the diameter ignition uh, don't behave as well as the acetic acid case, but still we can get pretty reasonable uh, agreement with the experiments. Okay, so uh, I guess I'm a bit late, so maybe I should skip this part. Um, so one thing that actually is important, and I want to conclude with that, uh, in a fast polarized bio oil is that since it's a very complex mixture, during combustion you can have formation of gas phase inside the, the liquid phase. And this is due to the fact that um, we have heterogeneous nucleation, uh, for example, on the fiber. And this is actually something you see in the experiments, but it's very difficult to model from a CFD point of view because we have to create like a gas phase from a liquid phase. And this is actually not possible like um, from a CFD point of view unless we prescribe the position of the, of the bubbles that are actually formed. 
And as you see, you see something like this. So bubbles that are actually forming in the liquid phase and that uh, go out uh, from the liquid phase uh, with this sputtering approach that, uh, with this sputtering phenomena that you actually see in, in experiments. So this is a work in progress that we are actually um, working on right now. And, um, and yeah, that's it. So of course, when you, um, Model synthetic, these very challenging aspects are present. So, nucleation has already told you the interaction between the phase change and surface tension, and the fact that you have many species inside your uh, your phase. So, to conclude, uh, I presented you some analysis you know, from the American point of view about acetic acid and ethylene glycol, which are surrogate components of phosphorylase by oil. And both um, evaporation and combustion are in pretty good agreement with experiments. Uh, you, I presented some uh, analysis on the heat flux from the fiber towards the droplet that is actually shown to be relevant and to uh, help to get the experimental results uh, captured by the, by, the, by the model. And uh, then a full uh, phosphorus by oil um, droplet is, is uh, been modeled. Um, and I, of course, presented some, something about the future work we're doing, so the bubble formation in the liquid phase. Uh, which can be done, which can be due to liquid phase chemistry, which are actually under develop, development. And of course, under development are also proper methods to couple the phase change and surface tension forces, which are really important in small bubbles, um, especially if they're included in small droplets. Okay, I think that's it. So if you have some, some question, I'll, I'm open to them. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker. And um, we have about two minutes for questions and comments. Are there any questions from the audience? Not yet. May I ask you something? Sure. Uh, you told us that um, you have only quenching of the reaction on the fiber. Uh, do you really believe that there is no... Uh, kind of uh, ignition or catalytic effect of the fiber in forming some active species like radicals if you have um, uh, what 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 is the material of your of your fiber it's uh, carbon silica oh carbon silica yeah okay. so i think it's pretty inert i don't think it actually interacts with the gas phase so uh -huh. the effect that i think is present is just a slightly quenching effect i mean that you have the temperature which is slightly slow, uh, lower and then you have the accumulation of some radical species in that in that area. So okay. here, okay. so as you see, the flame doesn't go like towards the domain, but it's actually kind of stopped there. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And and if you change the, the the material of the fiber for kind kind of metal or whatever, I don't know if it has uh, some some catalytic effect on the on the uh, reaction. Right. I, I, I everything so. changed. I mean, or... I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not doing the experiment, but I honestly don't think it, it does have some catalytic effect. And, uh, also because the temperature actually at the fiber are not that high, such as in the flame. So, I mean, if you see here just from a very rough analysis, so I would say that the temperature of the fiber are like 400 or 500 K. So, I mean, uh -huh. I, I don't okay. think it's enough to, okay. Okay. to start a reaction in that area. So, thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? If not, let's thank the speaker again. And uh, let's uh, proceed to the next presentation. And it will be the last presentation on this uh, first session. It will be provided by Professor Alberto Cuochi, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, um, from uh, two uh, uh, institutions from Italy. And uh, please announce the, uh, the the title of your presentation, and uh, the screens are yours for the next twenty minutes. Um, thank you, thank you very much. C can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, we can hear you, and we see your the, 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 your your uh, presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So th thank you very much, and good morning, uh, uh, everybody. 
Uh, so the title of my presentation is Numerical Modeling of Reactors for Chemical Vapor Implication with Detailed Homogeneous and Heterogeneous Kinetics. Uh, this is a work done in collaboration between, this is a collaboration between uh, the Crack Modeling Lab in uh, Polytechnic in Milano and Brembo SBA, which is a company uh, working in the field of uh, automotive uh, disc brake uh, technology. So uh, carbon disc brakes um, are um, very special materials uh, having uh, very good properties um, such as uh, high specific heat, high thermal conductivity, uh, they are very light, uh, they have excellent friction uh, properties, high resistance uh, to uh, mechanical strength at, uh, and uh, of mechanical strength, sorry, at high temperature. And so this makes uh, them uh, the ideal candidates uh, for uh, uh, applications in which high performance is required, uh, especially for the racing context, such as, for example, the Formula One uh, market. Uh, now, th there are several uh, techniques for uh, producing carbon disc brakes or more in general carbon carbon materials. And one of the most uh, commonly adopted is the chemical vapor infiltration or CBI uh, carried out at low, low pressure. In this type of process, basically, we start from a porous matrix or what we call a porous uh, preform consisting of a population of fibers overlapping uh, each other with a mean diameter of the order of 10 microns. Uh, this preform uh, has a very high porosity, around 70% uh, and uh, low density. The preforms uh, are then uh, put inside a um, heated reactor, uh, like the one which is, uh, let's say, uh, depicted here in this uh, picture uh, here, uh, where uh, a gaseous uh, uh, hydrocarbon, um, typically methane, is used uh, as a source of carbon in pyrolytic conditions and low pressure. Uh, this means that basically the original preform is exposed uh, to a gaseous environment at, the hot, uh, at high temperature, which is rich of species uh, deriving from the pyrolysis of methane, such as, for example, acetylene, ethylene, benzene, um, which penetrates inside the preform itself and uh, deposits over the exposed uh, surface of the uh, fibers. So th this is the typical uh, densification curve uh, that we can observe in a densification process like this. Uh, here, basically, we uh, are reporting versus time the uh, spatially average uh, density of the disk during the densification process. And you, you can see that uh, we can basically distinguish two different uh, regimes according to the rate at which the deposition uh, process occurs. So at the beginning of the uh, operations, the uh, porosity is very high. So basically there are no significant limitations in the um, uh, limitations offered by uh, mass uh, diffusion, by diffusivity. And, and so the process is governed by uh, a chemical, uh, the chemical kinetics, the chemistry. And so we are in a so-called chemical regime. On the contrary, when uh, the densification process, uh, let's say during the uh, densification process, the porosity decreases. And so uh, mass transfer uh, becomes the limiting phenomenon and we have a diffusion uh, regime. So th this is the typical configuration, uh, uh, reactor configuration, which is adopted in uh, Brembo for uh, producing these breaks for Formula uh, One applications. And uh, basically we have 20 disks uh, which are stacked on uh, each other uh, in this way here. So this is the uh, reactor. The reactor is about two meters uh, long, okay? And the typical operating conditions are the ones that you can read uh, here. Basically we have a temperature between 900 and 1200 Celsius degrees, pressure uh, going from few kilopascal to about 100 kilopascal and the total uh, duration of the process is typically very long of the order of 100 uh, hours. This type of process is carried out uh, at low pressure um, for uh, avoiding a too fast uh, deposition rate. Actually, uh, if the deposition rate is too fast, this is not good for the operation because actually there is no time 
for uh, the reacting gases mixture to penetrate inside the uh, preform. So the densification only occurs in the, let's say, external uh, region of the uh, matrix of this uh, preform. Uh, and the final quality of the produced disk is not uh, acceptable, of course. So we have to work at low pressure, but this means that the uh, densification rate is low, and so we have to account for high processing times. The conversion of methane in this kind of reactor is typically very low, and we can have also the formation of uh, formation and deposition of uh, soot. And so these are the main issues uh, in uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, technique in the chemical vapor infiltration. But there is uh, also an additional issue which is very important, very relevant, especially for large reactors, which is what I reported here, the variability uh, of with this uh, position. I mean, uh, if, we, if you look at the geometry of this reactor, uh, it, it is easy to understand that uh, this reactor uh, works like a sort of plug flow uh, system. And so this means that different disks in the different positions uh, are not exposed to exactly the same conditions. So we have to expect that the final density of the different disks is different according to the, their position in the reactor. And this is what is uh, also observed from the experiment on uh, an experimental basis. In particular, here in this plot, uh, I reported uh, the experimentally measured final bulk density uh, in this uh, 20 disk uh, re reactor according to their position. And so you can see that the final density is not exactly the same for uh, the different uh, disks. But we have this weird uh, uh, non-monotonic uh, behavior. And this is, of course, a problem from the production point of view, because this means that the uh, final disks have different uh, properties, different density, and different uh, qualities. So uh, what's the objective of this uh, collaboration between uh, our group in uh, Politecnico Milano and Brembo? Uh, we, we basically uh, have two uh, objectives. First of all, we uh, want to develop uh, a, a numerical tool for uh, modeling the densification process uh, occurring in a real scale uh, reactor. And so uh, what, what we want to do is to develop a model uh, able to deal with complex geometries, which is able to uh, consider complex chemistry, both for the homogeneous uh, phase, the um, pyrolysis occurring in the gaseous phase and the heterogeneous or deposition uh, phenomena. And which is computationally efficient because we want to deal with uh, real scale uh, reactors. And then, as a second step, once this model is available, of course, we want to use it for better understanding the physics uh, of what we are observing, for improving the geometry of the, this reactor, for optimizing the uh, operating conditions. Uh, at the current st stage of our collaboration, we just completed the first goal and we are now working on the uh, second point here. So let me start now um, spending some words about the numerical uh, methodology. Actually, the mathematical and numerical model we developed is based on models which are already available in, uh, in the literature. And this, uh, this is a list of uh, the main papers from which we uh, started uh, our uh, activity. However, in uh, our uh, model, uh, actually, we introduced two main uh, novelties. The first novelty is the adoption of detailed kinetic mechanisms, not only for the homogeneous phase, for the gaseous phase, but also for describing the heterogeneous chemistry, I mean, the deposition chemistry. And second point is that we developed a novel uh, numerical methodology, which is based on the partial decoupling between the gaseous flow in the reactor and the densification process in the disk. So this numerical methodology was specifically conceived for dealing with real scale uh, reactor, which are computationally very uh, expensive, uh, as you can imagine. Um, let me start from the uh, equations describing the uh, gaseous phase, I mean the phase surrounding the different preforms. Uh, actually, here we solve uh, the uh, usual transport equations for continuity, momentum, species, and uh, energy in laminar conditions because the conditions in a typical CVI reactors are uh, laminar. 
And then we have the uh, equations describing the uh, evolution of uh, porous uh, preform, I mean, the uh, deposition of uh, carbon in the porous preform. And in this case, we, this is the set of equations for every, that we solve for every preform. Uh, we have the uh, equations for the gaseous species, for the energy, for surface species, of course, and an additional equation describing the evolution of porosity. Uh, as I mentioned, we developed a special uh, numerical technique, uh, which is based on the decoupling between the uh, gases flow uh, in the reactor and the deposition in the uh, porous matrix. And we took and we take advantage of the clear separation of time scales uh, of these two processes. So from one side, the gases flow in the reactor uh, is characterized by a residence time, which is very small, uh, of the order of one second. But the densification process is super slow. Uh, um, it requires uh, about 100 hours. So th there is a clear separation between these two phenomena. And this means that actually in our approach, we model the densification uh, process by considering uh, the gaseous phase in a, a quasi steady state uh, formulation. Okay, and so th this means at the end of the story that uh, we, we can, first of all, solve the uh, gaseous flow in the uh, reactor, and then we can model the uh, deposition uh, processes. And we use two different tools for this purpose. For, so for the uh, CFD, uh, for the gas simulation, we use a CFD code, which is called uh, laminar smoke plus plus, which is based on uh, open foam, which is specifically conceived for uh, dealing with uh, detailed kinetic mechanisms, uh, um, complex geometries, and which is based on the operator splitting method. And then for the densification process, we uh, developed uh, a fully coupled and steady finite difference implicit uh, uh, code. Uh, I mentioned also that we adopted detailed kinetic mechanisms, both for the homogeneous and heterogeneous kinetics. In particular, for the homogeneous kinetics, we considered a mechanism including four species and 500 reactions, which was derived by reduction from a larger kinetic mechanism uh, developed in uh, Politecnico Milano. And uh, for the heterogeneous kinetics, we have a mechanism with involving uh, 60 species, more or less, and 200 elementary steps. And this mechanism was developed by Lacroix and uh, co-workers uh, about 10 years uh, ago. The, the model we um, uh, developed was, first of all, applied to a lab-scale uh, reactor in order to uh, validate the model uh, itself. So the, uh, this small uh, reactor includes only five disks, and Brembo had some experimental uh, data that we used for validation purposes. So here in this uh, plot, you, you can see the section of this uh, reactor. And you have to imagine that everything is uh, characterized by a cylindrical symmetry. So the simulations are carried out using two-dimensional geometries, which is a clear uh, advantage from the computational point, uh, point of view. And here you can also see the typical uh, operating conditions of uh, CBI uh, process. This is an example of a result. Um, and uh, in particular, um, if we look at the temperature field, which is reported here on the right side, we can see that the temperature is not perfectly uniform in this reactor. So we, we should expect uh, different densification histories for the five different disks and also different qualities for the uh, carbon matrix, which is uh, uh, deposited in uh, uh, the original uh, preform. But it's more interesting, in my opinion, to look at this plot here on the left side, in which we reported the local uh, residence uh, time. Uh, and which uh, show the existence of stagnation areas in the reactor. I mean, regions with recirculations or in which the gases mixture spent uh, a lot of time. Uh, the, the presence of these um, regions is not very good from the densification point of view, uh, because in this region, we should expect the formation of um, species with high molecular weight, for example, benzene or pyrene, naphthalene, and so on. And this is not good for the densification because uh, the presence of the species usually decreases 
uh, the quality of the uh, deposited carbon. So this is something that we uh, typically want to uh, avoid. Uh, okay, so sorry, I have a problem in, uh, there, there is a movie, but it, seem, it seems, okay, doesn't work, sorry. Um, okay, so let me skip this uh, slide, sorry for this. And let me move to the comparison between experimental data and, uh, uh, and numerical uh, results. Uh, okay, um, so here we have a comparison between the um, numerical simulations, which is represented by the lines and the experimental uh, data, which are the points. So you can see the uh, agreement is quite satisfactory. The problem is that the model uh, is not able to uh, distinguish between the different uh, disks uh, in, the, uh, in the reactor. And um, uh, on the contrary, from the experimental point of view, it seems there is a, a small, uh, let's say, impact of the disposition on the uh, final uh, bulk uh, density. Um, then uh, we uh, move the attention to the industrial scale uh, reactor, uh, which is basically very similar to the lab scale reactor. The difference is that now we have uh, about 20 uh, disks, so the size of the reactor is larger, but the uh, typical operating conditions are very, very uh, similar. Um, so we carried out the simulations and, for example, here we, we can observe uh, that in this reactor the differences in terms of temperature between the different areas are even uh, stronger than what we observed in the lab scale uh, reactor. Um, and this, of course, has an impact uh, on the final density of uh, preforms or the or final density of the different disks. And this is quite evident if we look at this picture here on the right, in which we reported the final bulk density for the uh, different disks. So now uh, there is a clear uh, dependence of the final density on the position of the different disks. And this means also different quality of these uh, disks. And this is something that we uh, don't want, of course, when we uh, carry out this kind of process. And if you like, the, the same type of information was also reported in one of the uh, first slides I uh, proposed, which is uh, uh, reported uh, here uh, again. Uh, if you remember, uh, I already presented this slide in which we have the final bulk density of the different disks uh, in this reactor. Uh, showing this non-monotonic behavior, and this is in agreement with what we observe from the numerical simulations here. So the, there is uh, the, the final density is not the same, and here we have a comparison with the uh, with the numerical simulations, which are represented by the blue lines. As you can see, the agreement is not perfect uh, for sure. There is a quantitative discrepancy, but we are pretty satisfied with this result because uh, actually the model seems to be able to correctly capture the, uh, the trend that uh, was uh, experimentally observed. In particular, we are able to capture the minimum uh, in a bulk density here in this region, in the central region of the reactor, and then the increase of density in the top of the uh, reactor. So now the idea as a future work is to try to understand the reasons why we have this weird uh, densification curve uh, along the, uh, the reactor. And we, we, we think that thanks to the, the model, we, can, we, we are able, we will be able to uh, give uh, an answer to this uh, question. So to summarize now that we have this um, this model, uh, we would like to use it for uh, uh, advancing our knowledge of the uh, densification process to better understand the impact of different operating conditions on the densification, on the quality of the disks. And of course, since this is a, a collaboration with the industrial world, we want to use this uh, model for improving the design of CVI reactors and to optimize the uh, operating conditions. Uh, so thank you very much for the uh, attention. If you have questions, I will be happy. Thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker.
unfortunately, we used all the time for our session. And uh, in 20 minutes, we have a beginning of the next sessions in all three halls. And uh, if we, if any from the audience uh, has um, questions to the uh, to the presenter, to any presenters, please use uh, the website or emails to to do that. And uh, I would like to thank again all the speakers on the att attendees of this of this session, and to remind you that all the presentations, which will were presented in uh, to other halls are available on the website of the conference. So you can go there and uh, look at any uh, presentation which uh, was given this morning and uh, next uh, during the next days of the conference. And uh, let me once again, thank you for, for attending this session and to wish you uh, a good days uh, and a very, uh, very good uh, uh, communications during this uh, this conference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
and you know, if you uh, if you just join now, so yeah, I mean, uh, I would say uh, on behalf of the um, organizers, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. And um, in this session, uh, we will have three um, three speakers uh, from um, from Italy and France. And um, yeah, we we would uh, yeah without further ado, we, we would like to uh, welcome our first speaker, uh, Professor uh, Martino Di Serio from uh, University of Naples, Federico II, Italy. Okay, uh, Professor Di Serio, time is yours. Thank you. I share my, my screen. Okay, can you hear the screen? The see, uh, see the screen? Yeah, it is up. You can okay, continue. thank you. Oh, okay, thank you everyone to be here and I start uh, with my presentation that is devoted to use of microreactors in net oxidation uh, reaction. Um, this reaction, as uh, you can see in the slide, is uh, used to produce uh, uh, essentially uh, uh, the um, um, surfactant because uh, you have the reaction between the uh, uh, fatty alcohol and uh, ethylene oxide. In this case, you can produce a, a um, pr product with a, a hydrophobic aid and a, a hydro hydrophilic aid and hydrophobic tail. Um, the reaction is really very exothermic because of the presence of uh, ethylene oxide that is an unstable molecule, so, so we, you can have a problem with the uh, safety of the reactor. The temperature used is uh, between 150 to 100 degree, and in general the pressure is around uh, less than 5 bar. Uh, you need to work in uh, pressure because uh, ethylene oxide is condition are is uh, um, in gaseous phases. So you have a repetition of, of ethylene oxide. Uh, for this reason, one of the problem of this reaction is the um, mass transfer from gaseous to liquid phases of ethylene oxide. There are several um, reactors that have been proposed in the literature. The classical steroid reactor, the jet loop uh, reactor, and also the uh, spray spray reactor. Um, the, um, the main aspect in this case is uh, sorry, there's something. Okay, one of the, the problem that is uh, linked with this type of uh, uh, reaction is uh, uh, linked with the fact that. Uh, at the end of a reaction, uh, you have a very low concentration in the gaseous phases and you have to re reduce it to, with a, um, a long procedure. And the, this is uh, um, uh, produce uh, a, a very long time of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of, of process. And another, another aspect is uh, that, uh, mm, uh, in general, this is a feedback uh, uh, processes. So you can have uh, first to the reaction, you have to fill the, your reactor, then you start the reaction, uh, arrive at the final, uh, uh, at the target of your production, then you have to reduce ethylene oxide in your react, uh, reactors, and attend, uh, reduce the temperature, discard the reactor, and restart. So you can imagine that this type of procedure can have a really strong impact on the productivity and also in the safety, because every of this type of uh, um, operation uh, are not easy to uh, take into in uh, strict control. So th there are a lot of uh, device to con around the reactor to control the, um, the situation. Uh, for this reason, uh, recently, sorry, uh, uh, I hear someone that are talking. No? You can just continue. 
Oh, okay. Um, okay. So, uh, so is it possible to uh, perform this reaction in a light reactor? Uh, oh, oh, so, the, sorry, uh, there is some something that is not working well. Uh, the wrong condition. Sorry, uh, here it is. Something that is not working, sorry. Yes, sorry. Uh, I want to see if you can share. I can share now my my screen. I think that there was. I start with the condition. You can see it. Oh yeah, I think okay, you can just continue from yeah. From okay, okay. No, so uh, sorry for the for the problem, but okay. At the end, uh, I try to re recover time. Uh, there are also uh, the, uh, the proposal in literature to use micro reactors. Uh, there are many proposals in the uh, patent literature, and also some examples are realized in the industry for not very high produ production. But there are some some plants that works, for example, around 100 kilos per hour of ethylene oxide. However. Uh, in Rechechu, there are there is a really in, interesting paper from a group of uh, Professor Kelm that uh, showed that, that it's possible to uh, have uh, this this reaction in a micro reactor uh, in isothermal condition with a micro reactor that have the dimension uh, of around to 200 400 uh, microns. Uh, it's a tube in uh, in in a uh, uh, thermostat buff, and the reaction condition uh, in this case, from point of view, temperature is not, uh, not uh, extreme, even if he, he can arrive also at 240 degree. But the most important thing is that uh, uh, the reaction is in. Um, in a liquid a liquid phase because of the system only liquid phase because the system works at 95 bar uh, as you can see here there there is uh, some runs uh, for uh, uh, production of a uh, 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 product with the free ethylene oxide per mole of uh, um, substrate at a different temperature. And the resistant time, as you can see, is very low. It's uh, less than one, one, one minute for the, uh, at a high temperature, can achieve the complete combustion. So, uh, in that, in that, at that time, the personal claim, group of personal claim interpreted this with the uh, PFR isothermal model, the, as a, and the, the, the data, uh, model fit the data very well. However, later, they showed that inside the, the reactor uh, is operative a uh, uh, um, laminar flow. flow. So uh, they, they interpreted the data and they showed that uh, they are all also able to interpret this data. And uh, anyway, the model, they use a comp really complicated model because uh, 
uh, they put together fluid dynamics and uh, um, kinetic aspect, uh, and they don't consider the uh, uh, the thermal uh, uh, balance because they think that uh, because they show that the system was uh, was system. However, if you want to go uh, to a, a more complicated system where you need to to uh, detect the thermal balance inside your reactor, because uh, I think in my in my opinion this is a good system, but we cannot use. Uh, micro reactor we have to use milli reactor and so in that case the mass uh, the heat transfer could be imp important we try to reduce to simplify the model and so we use a, a classical model with uh, a defined um, fluid dynamic behavior inside the, our reactor that is uh, the classical laminar um, uh, system so you can see here the mass balance uh, equation that we, we have used. So we are able to uh, simulate the concentration of ethylene oxide along the uh, reactor, but also along the profile of the reactor. Uh, to um, to um, simulate, uh, use this type of model, you need to define the re reaction rate. In this case, uh, we use uh, the classical model that, that was developed by us, in, in which the reaction is uh, linked to concentration of, of ethylene oxide and the concentration of catalyst. So the, the, the shape of reaction rate is uh, very simple. But the most important thing, this type of reaction that you have uh, during the um, reaction modifying of your, the, the um, uh, physical properties of uh, your uh, your system and mainly you have also an increase in volume of your, your uh, system so you have to uh, be able to describe the variation of density of uh, the molecules inside your reactor but also the viscosity the change of viscosity of your, your molecule for this uh, uh, reason uh, we use uh, several the correlation that you can see here and that is similar that to that was used by clay metal and at the end of history we use this uh, this model to simulate the same runs and we obtain really good results also with the lfr mo uh, our model uh, naturally there are differences in parameters because the two different uh, the two models are, are different as you can see here the model the two model pfr and lfr can describe uh, the consumption of uh, ethylene oxide along the reactor, as you can see in the left of this, uh, in the same way, so the, with the same uh, uh, performances. Uh, the difference in the parameters is uh, can be uh, an importance of difference in parameters can be here, see here, where you can uh, appreciate the difference uh, of concentration of ethylene oxide uh, along the um longitudinal lead of of the reactor as so you can see here uh, for the lfr in in, in 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 some cases you can have the um i really i i get conversion at the end of of uh, near the the wall of of the reactor so in the where the velocity of flow is a lot less so we can see that uh, we, con we can conclude that uh, uh, it's important to understand the real fluid dynamic in micro reactors because uh, mainly when you use this, uh, uh, also when you use this to de define uh, uh, parameters of your model, because in extrapolation you can have a strong problem. And we think that uh, it could be a, really a new way to make this reaction, but uh, to moving to, to um, milli reactor. So we are working to improve the, this model, in, uh, including also the uh, thermal balance. So I finish this my presentation. I, I hope that I don't take you too much time with the, my technical problem. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the interesting presentation and making up. I mean, yeah, making up time loss for uh, technical problems. Actually, pardon for the problem. So. Um, is there any questions from the uh, from the audience?
Yeah, actually, if not, uh, if there is no question from the audience, okay. um, yeah, I would like to ask to, uh, one more simple question. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you stated that your reaction, I mean, your micro reactor operates at a uh, pressure of ninety at like ninety five bar. Yeah. So, like, uh, I would like to ask, like, what kind of materials that is used to withstand? I mean, uh, materials in the milli reactors to withstand uh, such uh, like. That's high pressure for 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 this for this reaction uh, you don't have really problem with the corrosion so you can use also uh, typical stalin steel uh, reactor uh, you don't have a problem with the st stability of your material so and also because the the dimension of the tube is uh, really uh, small so uh, also mechanical strength is not really important when when you use micro reactor yes if you arrive to my milli reactor perhaps some some uh, study about the resistance of the material uh, must be done Anthony, I cannot hear you yeah, I mean could, yeah I mean that could be like an interesting follow-up for yeah for the okay. current study right yeah Okay, thank you very much. Um, oh, oh, is there any question? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm Hasan Kuyubish from Boğaziçi University. I'm a PhD student. Uh, I'd like to ask the difference between the two approaches that you presented. Um, I think a little bit more clarification would be better for us to understand the difference between the, uh, I think, the laminar, uh, I don't remember the name, but could you clarify the differences between the two approaches? Oh yes, the two approaches is, is uh, uh, because in one case is uh, the model um, was a uh, uh, thing that the flow uh, inside the reactor is a, a typical plug for reactor. So you have a, a same concentration along the um, the radius of, uh, of of your reactor. In the other case, you have a profile of a reaction. This is uh, um, this means uh, that. Uh, uh you, you can have uh, with if you use the same parameters kinetic parameters you will have a difference in, in how in, as output of your model okay uh, but can be not real model because uh, in some case you have a different uh, not uh, defined well concentration inside your reaction so the problem with this type of device and that you already have uh, uh, results in output and you can decide in which, which model you simulate these results. And you have also good, re, good results with the two models from point of view of final conversion. But this is, can work when you are working in simulation. The problem is that this model, we hope that we can all uh, use this model in uh, prediction of behavior of reactor because our idea is to start with the theoretical uh, job to have then the, the the possibility to design a real final reactor uh, for, for processes. So you need to know the real concentrations and your your uh, your reactor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the presentation and discussion. Yeah. Once once more, um, please give um, appreciation to Professor Di Serio. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And yeah, actually, I forgot to uh, introduce myself. Yeah, <laughs> my name is um, Anthony Hamza from uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology, Japan. So, like, I'm working on uh, as a researcher <laughs> in the university. So, yeah, I mean, uh, okay, without further ado, we will uh, continue to the second session. I mean, to the second speaker, which is from um, from Uni University of Lyon first. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, from uh, yeah, our speaker is there, is, uh, Mr. St uh, Dr. Stefan Kocic. Okay. Thank he will, you. Uh, yeah, he will uh, deliver his um, I mean his speech. I, I mean, uh, may present his work when uh, with the reactor. I mean, uh, in field of catalysis. Okay. Okay. Please welcome uh, Dr. Kocic. Your time is the time is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Just uh, uh, so that I put uh, my presentation uh did i share my screen or not uh not yet actually uh just a second uh sorry 
Uh, and what about now? Do you it's see up. Yeah, it's, it's up now. Yeah, you, okay. you, you can begin. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Uh, just a second. Um, some, uh, uh, oh, wow. uh, good morning. Oh, sorry, just to, uh, wow. Good morning to everyone. Uh, at the very beginning, I'd like to express a gratitude in the name of my colleagues uh, from Lyon to the organization committee for expressing their interest in our work. Uh, my name is Stefan Kocic. I'm a postdoctoral research, uh, researcher at the University of uh, Lyon 1. And today I'm going to present you the joint work of uh, two laboratories at the University of Lyon 1, uh, CP2M, uh, which is Laboratory of Catalysis Poly Polymerization uh, and Processes and Materials. Uh, and um, uh, the second one is uh, IRSA Lyon. Uh, it's the Institute of the Research on the uh, catalysis and the uh, environment uh, in uh, Lyon. Uh, this work uh, is uh, entitled uh, Appraisal and Modeling, Modeling of Internal Mass Transfer Limitations in Light Olefin Synthesis Using Bifunctional uh, Catalysts, uh, so-called uh, OX0 uh, process. Uh, so uh, at the beginning, I'm just going to uh, give some brief introduction on uh, regarding the importance of intimacy in the bifunctional uh, catalytic systems. Uh, then I'm going to present you uh, some obje objectives uh, of our work. Afterwards, I'm going to uh, briefly uh, present you a methodology uh, that we use, uh, notably uh, a reactor modeling approach uh, we applied uh, in studying uh, different systems. And afterwards, I'm going to present you some uh, results we obtained on mechanical uh, mixtures. And in the end, I'm going to uh, briefly expose your perspectives uh, of, of, our, of our work. So uh, at the very beginning, uh, we know that uh, many experimental work uh, in the literature uh, exists regarding the impact of intimacy on catalyst selectivity. Uh, on the other hand, whatever industrial process of question, uh, we know that it is very important to control the selectivity of desired products since this parameter uh, is uh, oftentimes uh, determinating in the economic feasibility of uh, some industrial process. Here I present you uh, one such study uh, of uh, impact of intimacy on uh, catalyst selectivity uh, regarding uh, bifunctional uh, catalytic systems for a process that is called syngas to lower olefins. Uh, as you can see, uh, depending on the uh, uh, intimacy uh, between different functions, uh, functions uh, that uh, dis dissociate CO and H2 um, uh, bonds, uh, metallic oxide function, and function uh, second function, which is uh, usually uh, some acid, fun acid function, we see that the, uh, depending on the intimacy between those two uh, functions, uh, the uh, selectivity of uh, products, in this case, uh, lower olef olefins, uh, may be uh, highly uh, may be highly impacted by this uh, intimacy. Uh, in this uh, concrete work, authors uh, also suggested that that proximity facilitates transfer of uh, reaction intermediates that can be formed uh, during uh, this uh, complex uh, chemical reaction. Um, another important study regarding oxyl process is. Uh, uh, the one I'm presenting you here, where multiple stack, stacking of layers of different functions have been used to achieve a variable uh, intimacy be between uh, different function. As you can see from this figure, it, it has been shown that for different uh, configurations of functions, uh, we have uh, we observed uh, diff rather uh, different selectivity of uh, of uh, products. Um, uh, lastly, uh, uh, it's another remarkable work uh, in the uh, uh, in the um, uh, regarding intimacy um, in the bifunctional catalysis is the work of Zekcevic and colleagues, uh, where uh, nanoscale intimacy uh, has been um, has been uh, put uh, in evidence. In this work, uh, platinum is deposed either in close uh, proximity of zeolite or a binder. And they showed that uh, this work is particularly important because uh, it outlines the fact that traditional Weichbretter uh, criteria and related intimacy criteria, uh, which means the closer the functions, the better, uh, uh, don't hold. 
uh, as, it, as it could be seen uh, from the closest proximity between metal and ze zeolite acid sites, which have uh, the, the, the determinantal uh, effect on this selectivity. Um, so basically, uh, there are many experimental evidences in the literature that shows that uh, intimacy ha can have a strong impact on both activity and selectivity in those bifunctional catalytic systems. And we know that uh, it is also, uh, uh, let's say, impacted. There is a complex interplay between chemical transformations that take place on the surface of uh, different uh, catalysts, such as their reaction rates, uh, nature of intermediates that can be formed, but also mass transfer limitations, uh, such as, uh, for example, diffusion of uh, reaction intermediates. Um, and in the end, we also have the impact of uh, intimacy. So. Uh, in, in, in our opinion, literature today lacks quantitative description uh, of the impact of uh, density of contact, uh, which is also called in-touch intimacy, as well as the distance between different functions uh, in uh, those uh, uh, catalytic uh, systems. In order to establish quantitative description of multiple, multiple phenomena, sorry, we need to model uh, the uh, reaction diffusion process uh, occurring inside those uh, bifunctional catalysts in the reactor. In this work, uh, which is industrial strategic uh, syn gas conversion towards lower olefins, uh, so called uh, oxazeo process, more particularly the one in which uh, metal oxide function is an anionized oxide and uh, acid function is uh, SAPOL 34 uh, bicatalytic uh, system. So uh, the main objective from a uh, chemical uh, engineering perspective uh, is developing uh, a reactor model packed with por porous solid catalysts that contain active sites for syngas to reactions or bifunctional catalysts. So we need to take into account the different uh, scales, such as uh, I, I, I call them here macro meson uh, micro scale. Uh, or although that might not be uh, the most proper uh, terminology. So we need to have a proper description of multiple phenomena such as convection, diffusion, and reaction taking place. Um, our goal is to extend this uh, reactor uh, model to different macro scale, meaning different uh, reactor bed configurations as shown in previous experimental studies, uh, as well as mesoscale conf configurations, uh, meaning uh, varying uh, whether are we, we are going to use uniform solid pallets or may, we may also use uh, uh, well-known core shells uh, and other forms of uh, on the balance. So the, the main objective is, of course, analyzing the impact of intimacy on product selectivity. So in this work, we um, uh, on this slide, I'm presenting you a reactor modeling approach uh, we use. So we are neglecting external gas solids transfer limitations uh, in the oxazeo process. Uh, however, we are uh, describing intraparticle diffusion, diffusional limitations. We calculate uh, effective diffusion coefficient for all species uh, in, a, in, a, in a gas phase, and we perform a material balance on sphere spherical particles. Uh, concerning hydrodynamics, we assume plug flow uh, uh, of the plug we, we, uh, we take into consideration plug flow assumption, and we calculate gas superficial velocity variation in, in accordance with total pressure that is constant in, in, in our studies. Uh, we are neglecting uh, pressure drop and we are working at isothermal and isobaric uh, conditions. Therefore, uh, uh, we can say that this, this is uh, in fact the uh, robust transient 1D pseudo uh, homogeneous uh, uh, model. So here, here I'm uh, presenting a figure of a uh, system that we actually uh, model. So we have a reactor scale, uh, we have pallets, uh, uh, in this concrete example uh, that I'm going to present you, we are talking about mechanical mixture between function one and function two, function that is acid and function that is um, uh, oxide of uh, metal. So um, uh, we have different uh, uh, different catalyst particle that corresponds to either function one and fun function two. Fun function two. Uh, so um, you know, we are interested in calculating 
talking tracing gas concentration uh, that depends on uh, where uh, uh, are we uh, at the uh, reactor line, the final dimension of the reactor, but we also trace concentration of gas inside particle uh, acid function and metal oxide function, or those, uh, those CP are shown here. And in the end, uh, considering that we are adopting microkinetic model uh, in this study, we are all taking place on uh, some SAPO 34. Um, as you can see, uh, uh, intermediate assumed in our study uh, for OX0 process is, uh, is uh, methanol. So in total, we have uh, 30 different compounds in a gas phase. We have 20 different surface species, and we have in total uh, 43 uh, chemical reactions. Uh, here I'm just uh, presenting you the um, uh, outline uh, summary of equations that are uh, that are uh, basis of, of our model. The question that uh, we had is how to simultaneously uh, uh, resolve uh, this uh, multi-scale model. So uh, we did uh, some special discrete, discrete, I'm not going to pass a lot of time on this uh, particular um, uh, discretization scheme. Uh, it suffice to say, if you have any questions uh, uh, afterwards, uh, we can uh, go back to this. Uh, but it suffice to say that we used finite differences uh, to uh, discretize, discretize, sorry, a convection and diffusion uh, term in a, in a, for a concentration uh, of the gas gas molecule, molecules. Sorry. Uh, we did the same for uh, uh, spatial discretiz discretization of uh, uh, concentration of uh, gas inside of a uh, particle uh, term. So basically, uh, our model uh, found, written in MATLAB uh, contains several procedures uh, uh, that, uh, such as uh, we, we should load the stoichiometry of reactions, different properties of catalysis of uh, the uh, catalyst palette. We discretize uh, uh, all the parameters uh, to be uh, discretized, such as uh, number of slices uh, uh, of a reactor, number of slices of a uh, uh, palette. Uh, we uh, load operating, operating conditions, uh, such as pressure, temperature, uh, etc. Uh, we load kinetic rate constant. We can uh, we, uh, uh, calculate at the beginning effective diffusion uh, coefficients uh, of different species, and we impose initial concentrations of uh, gas phase, uh, gas inside particle, and adsorbed 
species for all species uh, for all the sections of the reactor and all the sections of the catalyst ring. We call all the uh, uh, all the uh, all the uh, uh, 50 S uh, uh, solver of uh, MATLAB. Uh, we calculate uh, transition, uh, sorry, uh, transitory uh, time dependent uh, uh, VCs uh, over DT terms. Uh, and therefore, we, we, we uh, integrate uh, our uh, model in order to obtain uh, different concentrations. So, uh, uh, concerning the fitting procedure, uh, we use the LSQ nonlinear in MATLAB, uh, which is a least square method. We define objective functions using objective functions, sorry, uh, using this formula, and we minimize objective function as a function uh, of the rate constants. Uh, this is not very important. Before I present you some uh, results we obtained so far, I like I would like just briefly to show you uh, some experiment experimental data observation regarding mechanical mixtures. What we see here. Uh, regarding mechanical mixtures uh, points that are obtained uh, at uh, Irsalion. Um, we see that uh, methane trends are somewhat complex with uh, variation of mass of oxy metal oxide uh, versus uh, acid function. What we see is that methanol is entirely consumed uh, over sapo 34 catalyst. And we also can see based on selectivities of CO2 that CO2 is mostly formed on uh, on a uh, metal oxide function. So our goal is we had different goals when we approached uh, the fitting procedure. Uh, we wanted first just to estimate to do a fitting only over the uh, met uh, metal oxide uh, uh, phase in order to estimate the kinetics over uh, this uh, uh, monofunction. Then we wanted to introduce uh, experiments with different mechanical mixtures where, where catalyst masses were right. And in the end, we also wanted to add other points uh, that uh, Irsalion uh, obtained, uh, such as those in where variation of temperature, pressure, etc. Uh, were, uh, were, were accounted on. So um, uh, concerning pitting goal one, uh, we uh, succeeded in um, uh, it's not uh, of the great surprise, considering that we used all, only one experimental point uh, to fit uh, a lot of theoretical rate constants. So we succeeded in uh, obtaining something that is uh, reasonable, but once again, it is not a great surprise, considering that our system is underdetermined. Therefore, uh, it's uh, well. Uh, however, uh, when we wanted to add some other points, uh, those in uh, in which a mass were right, uh, mass of oxide, metal oxide versus uh, support 34. Uh, we had some problems uh, uh, considering that uh, we obtained surface poison, poisoned with some oxygen containing species. So we saw that in fact, uh, the problem lies in the fact that we do not have enough hydrogen that goes to support 34. Therefore, we needed to introduce additional reaction uh, in our uh, reaction network, which is a hydrogen spillover uh, uh, reaction. So this is a hypothesis we use. Um, this fitting is still in progress. As you can see, uh, the orders of magnitude uh, that we obtained so far are, um, are, are OK, but uh, trends uh, that we observe still are not uh, well reproduced. And this is because uh, similarly optimization of, uh, of uh, this model uh, takes uh, a lot of time. So it's very time consuming. So I'm sorry I couldn't uh, finish uh, all this uh, for you today. As a perspective, so we, we wish to pursue further computationally expensive, expensive optimization of kinetic model using our in-house experimental data. And uh, afterwards, we want to extend our reactor modeling approach to account for distinctive reactor and catalyst grain configurations, such as one shown uh, in uh, my abstract. Uh, and we wish in the end to calculate the effectiveness factor for differently intimate uh, systems uh, for oxygen process. And of course, we wish to optimize uh, this model towards uh, maximization of lower uh, all of his facilities. Uh, thank you very much. And where is I? Uh, I, I, I out timed myself. Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, if you have any, uh, for your attention, sorry, if you have any questions for me, I would uh, uh, be glad to answer. Uh, here you can find uh, the uh, contact email of uh, all the uh, colleagues uh, at both laboratories that contributed uh, to this work. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice presentation, uh, Dr. Kocic. Did you um, a second? Yeah. yeah, I don't see you. Oh, uh, oh, it's okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
Indeed. Yeah, if, uh, yeah, if, uh, if anybody has questions, you can just uh, email. Uh, I mean, directly contact it by email. Okay. And um, yeah. And lastly, um, uh, we, we would move to the last uh, presenter from a uh, group from um, Politecnico di Milano uh, from Italy. So uh, we would like to uh, welcome uh, the last, uh, the speak, I mean, the speaker from, uh, from Politecnico, uh, Politecnico di Milano, uh, um, Professor um, Carlo Visconti. So uh, yeah. Uh, please welcome uh, Professor Visconti. Thank you, Anthony. Let me share my screen. Okay, so thank you again, Anthony, for the kind introduction and good morning, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the intensification of heat transfer in compact catalytic reactors using the Fischer Propsch synthesis as model reaction. And this work has been carried out at Politecnico di Milano at the Laboratory of Catalysis and Catalytic Processes. Um, why have we selected the, the Fischer Propsch synthesis as model reaction? For at least three reasons. First, the FT is one of the key processes for the energy transition, allowing the conversion of natural gas, biomasses, organic waste, and CO2 plus renewable power into high quality liquid fuels. Second, in the context of energy transition, FT often calls for compact reactors. Indeed, the carbon sources to exploit are rather small. Let's think, for example, to the CO2 emitted in a hard to abate industry or the amount of biogas available in a typical plant. This goes exactly in the opposite direction to what has happened in the last 20 years when uh, reactor technologies for FT have been developed for the exploitation of giant natural gas fields. So the question is uh, how to scale down these technologies. And today I'm going to focus on multi-tubular reactors, which are more convenient to scale down with respect to slurry bed reactors. Third, the fischer trop synthesis is a highly exothermal process, occurs under kinetic control and has a large activation energy, and also exploits catalysts that are very sensitive to temperature. Accordingly, the temperature management in the FT is very challenging, not only because we need to preserve the catalyst selectivity and stability, but also, and this is very important, because uh, of the risk of thermal runaway. That said, what I'm going to present to you today is valid for any catalytic reaction characterized by a strong exo or endothermicity. Now, the heat transfer within multi-tubular packet bed reactors relies on a convective heat transfer mechanism, which in the case of large fischer tropsch reactors is made efficient through the use of very long catalyst tubes and high recirculation rates. So the question is how to manage the heat transfer in shorter multi-tubular reactors. Over the last 20 years, our group has proposed to adopt conductive structure internals, such as honeycombs, open cell foams, and POX, to exploit the fast conductive heat transfer mechanism through the solid matrix as dominant heat transfer mechanism in compact catalytic reactors. In analogy, with the catalyst for acid treatment, those, su those substrates were initially thought to be activated by wash coating. However, we soon realized that this technique has two main limits. First, the low catalyst, catalyst inventory per unit volume, which is inadequate for slow reaction such as fischer tropsch and then the difficult catalyst replacement. We have thus proposed to overcome this limit by packing the catalyst in the cavities of the structure internals. As you can see, for example, in those pictures that refer to open cell foams. This solution is, of course, inappropriate for long reactors due to the high pressure drop. But this is not a limit for compact and, I mean, short multi-tubular reactors. So today I'm going to give you an overview of the activities we have done to assess and optimize the performances of those 
packet structured reactors. And we started more than 10 years ago with the aluminum honeycombs manufactured by extrusion. We packed those structures with a powdered cobalt on gamma alumina FT catalyst, and we tested a very small sample, four centimeter long, one inch or so in diameter, in the lab scale reactor available at Poligny. And as expected, even at CO conversion higher than 60%, with duties in excess of one megawatt per cubic meter, the axial temperature profile measured in the monoid sensor line was substantially flat. We then repeated the same test by removing the aluminum honeycomb from the reactor and replacing it with an inert alumina packing so to keep the same reactor geometry and the same catalyst density. And the result was quite shocking. During the reactor startup, as soon as the catalyst uh, temperature went over 200 degrees C, we experienced a thermal runaway and the catalyst was deactivated. That was the first proof that the conduction within, um, within aluminum and within the thermally connected aluminum honeycomb was game changing. Together with ENI, who was also quite astonished by those results, we moved towards a bigger and more representative scale. And we thus tested a one meter long packet conical monolith, one inch or so in diameter, loaded with 300 microns catalyst microspheres, so to limit the pressure drop on one side while preventing poor diffusion limitation at the same time. And this monolith was tightly fitted within the reactor, exploiting an innovative method we patented in 2014. We operated the reactor at constant pressure, feed composition, and space velocity, and we progressively increased the coolant temperature so as to increase the uh, CO conversion up to 70%. At that conversion, we measured duty in excess of one megawatt per cubic meter. And as you can see from those temperature profiles, at all the investigated conditions, the temperature was flat, with temperature differences between the coolant and the hot spots always below 10 degrees C. From the collected data, we estimated an overall heat transfer coefficient of about 1.5 kilowatt per square meter per K, which is a huge number for such a short reactor, one meter long. Some years later, we moved to open cell foam, again made of aluminum. And with respect to the honeycomb monolith, open cell foam has the unique advantage not to cause the radial segregation of the flow, which may be critical under some circumstances. And again, we started the experiment at the lab scale with a very small commercial foam sample, four centimeter long, one inch in diameter. We select the foam with 40 ppi, and we packed in the form a very active platinum promoted cobalt and gamma alumina catalyst. And again, as done in the case of the honeycomb monolith, we compared the performances of the packet form with that of uh, a conventional packet bed where the aluminum form was replaced by anert alumina. And again, experiments have been done at constant pressure, feed composition, and space velocity by progressively increasing the temperature in the reactor. We were able to achieve, in the case of the packet foam reactor, to which those red points refer to, up to almost 70%, with volumetric heat duties in excess of 1,400 kilowatts per cubic meter. Notably, the catalyst was very stable, for during the 800 hours on stream, as verified through those activity checks at the 20 degrees C at constant time interval. When the same experiment was repeated with the packet bed configuration, see the black point here, a thermal runaway occurred when we were trying to increase the temperature from 190 to 195 degrees C, as you can see from the black line here. And this happened with volumetric duties below 100 kilowatts per cubic meter. 
That was, uh, again, a proof of the intensified heat transfer granted by the foam. But to be even more representative, very recently, we extended the experimental campaign using a brand new pilot reactor built uh, at Polimi within the ERC project intent led by my colleague, Professor Enrico Contoni. And in this case, a foam sample, 20 centimeter long, 28.7 millimeter in diameter, with the same geometry of the foam sample used at the lab scale, but now packed with 60 grams of catalyst in the form of 300 microns cobalt lumina particle, has been tightly loaded in an externally cooled tubular reactor cooled by diathermic oil. And experiments have been carried out as usual at constant pressure, hydrogen to CO in saturation space velocity, by progressively increasing the oil temperature until achieving a CO conversion of about 70%. And here you can see the temperature profiles we measured along the reactor axis, which became progressively more steep by increasing the oil temperature. And a rough estimate of 500 watts per square meter per K has been obtained from some preliminary run completed very recently in the last weeks, which is a real outstanding value for such a short reactor, only 20 centimeters long. And we are currently working to find the limits of this reactor configuration. But in parallel to those pilot activities, we have been working also at the lab scale with the periodic open cellular structure, the so-called POX, a new type of substrate which was made available with the development of a 3D printing technique using metals as raw material. And these materials are in principle even more interesting than open cell foam, thanks to the excellent control of the geometry, which is obtained on the basis of an engineered CAD model. And this offers 100% reproducibility of the, of the structures, which can be fully customized and thus optimized. As done with the honics and the foam, we studied the pox at first at the lab scale, using exactly the same unit and the same reactor used for monolith and foam. And uh, the tested POC sample, manufactured at the mechanical engineering department of Polytechnic de Milano, is again four centimeter long, 28 millimeter in diameter, and has been 3D printed with a diamond cell geometry using a highly conductive aluminum alloy. And these are the results obtained in terms of CO conversion when increasing the temperature from 190 to 230 degrees C, again, at constant pressure, uh, fit composition, and space velocity. And as you can see, we measured CO conversion in excess of 80% at 230 degrees C without affecting anyhow the catalyst stability, even in the longer run. And here you can see the results in terms of heat transfer. In particular here, the packet box represented in blue are compared with the results obtained with the packet foam in red and with the packet bed in black in the same reactor, looking at the heat released per unit volume of the reactor as a function of the external temperature gradient, that is as a function of the the difference between the temperature on the um, structure axis and the temperature of the wall of the reactor. And here it is clear that the packet box outperformed the packet form configuration, which in turn outperformed the packet bed reactor. This result, also looking at uh, those pictures, has been explained considering the much better and more regular contact between the POC structure and the reactor wall, which is granted by the extremely regular structure of the POC. What's next? If uh, the contact at the interface between the structured substrate and the reactor tube is so relevant, how can we maximize it? And the last concept we have recently proposed are the so-called POCs with the scheme. In uh, this configuration, 
which imitate that of the Honeycomb monolith, still preserving the possibility for the reactive mixture to flow in the right direction, the box is 3D printed with an outer metallic layer made of the same material, which we call skin. And here, you can see the heat transfer performances of the packet box with skin in green, compared with those of the packet box in blue and the packet foam in red. And it is clear that uh, the packet box with the skin can manage a given volumetric heat duty with the temperature gradient in the reactor, which is half with respect to that of the box without the skin and one third of that of uh, the packet foam. Considering that the internal structure of the packet box with and without the skin are identical, this effect is uniquely due to the vector contact at the interface between the box and the reactor. And this is the secret to fully exploit the performances of highly conductive structure internals packed with catalyst pellets. We are now working to give a precise numerical estimate of the overall heat transfer coefficient granted by packet box with skin and without the skin using the pilot scale reactor that we have built at Polini. And I hope to be able to give you some updates soon. Nevertheless, I hope that the information we collected so far are more than enough to demonstrate that the adoption of thermally connected structured inserts made of conductive material is a unique solution to enhance the overall transfer performances of fixed bed reactors. Packing the catalyst in the structure allows to increase the catalyst inventory and so to increase the reactor productivity per unit volume. And the secret to further boost uh, the heat transfer is maximizing the contact point at the wall structure interface. And last but not least, these results that I've presented you today with the reference to the Fischer Tropsch are uh, very interesting for any heat transfer limited process, including all those processes that are pivotal for the energy transition. And with this, I would like to acknowledge all the PhD and postdocs that uh, took part in this long project through the years, my colleagues, mentors, and co-authors, uh, Enrico Tronconi, Gian Piero Groppi, and Luca Lietti, the European Research Council for the funding within the INPEN project, and ENI that shared with us the first part of this long journey. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much for the outstanding presentation. So we've got uh, two minutes for questions. So like uh, anybody from the audience I have questions? Okay. May I ask uh, from Usden? Oh, sure. Uh, hello, Professor Visconti. Thank you uh, for this inspirational uh, presentation. Uh, I want to ask something uh, in the experimental side of the of your work. And did you ever check that your uh, highly conductive Fox material are giving any uh, catalytic activity, uh, regardless of the catalyst? Yeah, this was one of the first things we studied. Though we checked the chemical inertia of the material we have loaded in the reactor, and we verified that. We also verified how the presence of the structure internal was affecting the packing ability of the catalyst, not only the chemical reactivity. And again, we verified that provided that the ratio between the diameter of the catalyst and the diameter of the cavities of the structural substrate is sufficiently low, Basically, the packing of the catalyst does not suffer of the presence of the structure internal. I see, thank you. Uh, can I ask one little more question? Uh, what is the purpose of this uh, sandwiched alpha alumina between the catalyst? Uh, you mean in uh, the laboratory reactor? Yes. Uh, the, uh, alpha alumina layers uh, above and uh, below the catalyst layer. What no, is the what, purpose of it? Yeah, yeah, we're just made put there to make sure that uh, the catalyst was remaining in the central part of the structure. But uh, in the experiment at the pilot scale, there is no alpha alumina around. It's okay, just to facilitate things in the lab. Okay. okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. <clears throat> Well, actually, I'm I'm impressed with uh, the number, yeah, the number of 
um, questions. Uh, I mean, potential. I mean, questions in this session. But unfortunately, the, uh, the time is up. And yeah, I think for uh, those who have questions to um, to Professor Visconti, you can just send uh, emails directly to directly to him. So uh, and uh, before we leave. Uh, I would like to remind. Uh, I would like to remind you that uh, the presentation is uh, for the slide uh, slide presentations, and um, I mean posters are available in the, in the official website of, uh, of the conference of um, Chem Reactor Twenty Four. So yeah, um, without further ado, yeah, with, uh, we wish you um, a good day and more communication and exchange even after this session. Thank you very much. <laughs>